بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على من اسمه سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم سيدنا أحمد صلى الله عليه وسلم سيدنا حميد صلى الله عليه وسلم سيدنا محمود صلى الله عليه وسلم سيدنا أحيد صلى الله عليه وسلم سيدنا وحيد صلى الله عليه وسلم سيدنا ماحي صلى الله عليه وسلم سيدنا حاشير صلى الله عليه وسلم there's that performative element and I have to keep watching what I say that I'm just like, I for me it's like I know that given who I am and how I sort of operate um, my being on stage or putting myself into any position where you know I, like basically I know that the, the, the fight against my nafs is to talk less do you know what I mean? Thanks. Like I'm always going to have an issue of, of talking too much and having an overinflated idea of, of what I'm saying and, and loving the sound of my own voice. And I think that to be on a podcast sort of feeds that. Mm. For me, it's the opposite. For me, it's like, uh, talking. Do I have to? Yeah. <laughs> Why are you saying like, bro, we have, we have like, an American like, audience. Like, like, I don't know. It's like, um, <laughs> Maybe we should just do this now. Like just talk like this so they can understand us better. <laughs> um, but yeah, for me, it's more like a drag. Bro, why did you guys to. do this accent before, like from episode one, we've got more American viewers than Rope Because you know, look, we got a lot of comments like, oh, sometimes I don't understand what you're saying. Uh, I get so confused. People actually say that? Yeah, I've heard, like, I've seen comments <laughs> like that. So I'm like, are you like for real? Like, we were speaking English, I Because I feel like Australians have to like endure it because it's like all the contents from America. So you're just like used to it. It's and it's like, to us, yeah. But then to them, it's like, you know, it's like, do you, guys talk you know, you know, it's yeah. like, you know, uh, when it comes to like experiencing the world, we have to experience it through how white people experience it. So like for a Bengali, it's <laughs> refs like I do, yeah. <laughs> Bengali's like you know I don't know, uh you know can we call you Mo instead of like Muhammad or something? I don't know. Like you just have to succumb to that. Can we call you Josh instead of Joshua. <laughs> <laughs> uh, funny story. Like um, whiteness like white people draw boundaries around who is white. So mm. the white kids at my school, they couldn't hack that I was a Josh. They're like, oh, Fayez, Fayez. Fayez. Oh, like, <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. they, made, they, made they made it clear to draw Shake that Faze, distinction. As in, Faze. they wouldn't call me it's Josh. A compliment, bro. Shake this Faze. is like, you know, the jock whites, like the 20, yeah. like they play rugby, rowing, they're like the SKs, this and that. Like they would not call me Josh. That's hilarious. Man. And it's it's like, when I thought about it back in uni, I was like, huh, that's really weird. How, is that like, an epiphany? Like one day, just like, you're just like, whoa. Okay, I've, I've like. No, it's like when you study like uh, racism, whiteness. You're like shit. I experienced like, like three years of yeah, study yeah. and finally unpack those, those like, experiences. Uh, yeah. Were even racist to me though. Like that's the thing. Like you know when I realized sort of the race, the relativity of it all was like when in the first time I was white it was like when I went to uni. I hung out with like brown people mostly. Um, brown people POC uh, from yeah, migrant background, yeah. Afghan Arab backgrounds, and it's like okay, now I know I'm white. But before that, I was always like a dirty wog. And like if I ever tried to be like, yeah, you know, white people, they'd be like, shut up, you dirty wolf. So in the eastern suburbs, it's even more exclusive. Wallahi, this that guy, is. Sean Douglas, told me to go back to where I came from in year seven. And I was like, okay. Wow. Sean <laughs> Douglas. What if he <laughs> listens to podcasts? Just... Bro, Sean Douglas does not listen to anything. <laughs> it's, um, it's You know, he, he didn't actually like me. When he started respecting me, it was after cricket. Because like I bowled him like a few bumpers, you know, and I was pretty quick, even year seven days. Mashallah. And after that, he came, he full started sucking up to me, being like, Oh, hey, bro, how you going? <laughs> yeah, ref, how you going, mate? The, yeah, as in, this this becomes a different discussion about um, pathways to respect in high school, but like mm. to overcome that racial barrier, like barrier. being good at sport is a sure way. Yeah. Like you're respected. Oh, you get so much respect. You're respected. Yeah. Like even if you're not like oh, the racial element as well, um, you can overcome that. You just become the re- guy really good at sport and then they respect you. Or you um, start going to the gym and then they respect you. Or you're like... Um, you're really cool and you pull all the girls then yeah there's, there's in like a couple of different avenues was there three three avenues for the guys the, the trinity of i think we discussed this before like <laughs> previous podcast um was that, what was it sport gym and girls and girls there were guys i know one of my best friends in year seven um he used to hang out in our group right our group was like sort of middle of the range right we weren't like the popular group but then he he pulled this bro he's punching um punching hard this guy yeah and then Can you explain what that terminology means no. for, for no. it's better that i don't 
um who knows bro this like if i if i genuinely i'm gonna stick to my word and not not do a podcast anymore then i guess i can say whatever i want um but yeah this guy was punching hard and then everyone after that like he just you could just see him move up through the like social groups till he made it to like the, the cool group and he became like really respected and close mates with all the cool groups he never hung out with us anymore it was all because he punched and he, he it's he like it's like, like the master it's like oh, it's like a master key to mm. master that's key. like lord of the ring he found the fountain of youth <laughs> 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 to be honest yeah as in that that immediately increases respect as in even psychologically probably even to this day yeah um yeah it does it does i know it does definitely people look at you like and treat you differently um if you like i know myself because it's just like if you see someone driving a really nice car as well, like i mean the way that men work i think think about like what the suggestion that sport girls and gym are the three avenues for universal respect in as a man like people talk about the threat of, and of the how would you say the erosion of traditional values by the left um the quote unquote what did jordan peterson say today the degenerate walk the degenerate walk left oh, no, no. um i yeah. swear he's an alien that guy but he he goes yeah the degenerate walk left hi, all. Hi, all. hi muslims <laughs> it's again it, message to the muslims yeah but no it was i was gonna say like um I don't, bro, like, the thing is that this course just falls flat on me because I never experienced that. Because, like, growing up, that was the case, right? If that's still the case, and that's, like, our experiences, how far has it really fallen? Yeah. We're still it? very Spartan, bro. Oh, okay. Yeah, don't yeah. you think, like, the, the value placed on, like, physical prowess, on, like, sexual prowess, that's still, like, of the utmost priority, right? And I don't really think that's under threat. Like, if you go to most boys' schools around here, I don't think that's, that's any different nowadays. I'm not commenting, by the way, on it, whether it should or shouldn't be the case. That's a different discussion. But I'm just saying, as it really is, I don't know if I hack that discourse of everything's falling apart and morality and manliness. I don't, I, don't, I don't think, like I said, whether that's right or wrong, I'm not commenting on. But I just don't think that that's the reality. I don't think that the ideas, the traditional ideas of masculinity whatever that means like as they define it as the meninists and the and the um traditionalists define it i don't think that that's really as under threat as they say it is mm. it's sort of like a f whenever they they uh, bring up examples they're kind of false flag operations mm. Mm. do you know what i mean in that sense yeah. yeah i think for me i find those conversations boring as well in general i don't feel i feel it's like it's just way too simplistic where it doesn't really get to the heart of like for example we always talk about certain topics and I know, I know, and, you know where we, this is going. I'll use. I'll try to talk about it without using the terminology if we're annoying our listeners too much. But essentially, it's like <laughs> <laughs> if they're still here, then they like it. You know what I mean, though. No, but I realize like some of them I like sort of listen to again just to see if we're talking about the same things in again and again. But we, to be honest, we talk about fourteen different ways and different ways of looking at it. Like for example, that episode we did when we talked about like do people good people go to hell? Like we use different lenses to it and approaches is good. But I don't want to kind of overdo it. But aside from that, it's like at the end of the day, people have different needs. People have a disposition, right? And so for me, it's like getting to the heart of that and then catering things accordingly to that, right? So I feel that that conversation is just completely absent because it's like it's like having living by what you deem is to be um, principles that should be followed, which is a completely wrong way of looking at it anyway in the sense that like, hey, males should be like this, females should be like that, and that's it. Whereas obviously islamically there is a system and a way that we have to do things and there's a responsibility that men should take principles, yeah. of course and that's not for me like i think we talked about on the top episode to be honest where it's like there's that but then there's the underlying issues and emotional stuff and way people um, process you know things and the out natural outlook of the world like all these sort of conversation like for example let's just say um like we talked about, I think, Taba, we talked about like using the activist space as a way to, you know, for example, someone might have like, I don't know, daddy issues, like he brought it up. But then it's that, that space is used to gain that affection or center of attention or that, right? So like we know our do's, our don'ts. I think everyone knows, like, you know, you have Mus uh, practicing Muslims that go up to like non-practicing Muslims, right? And they're just like, hey, you know, you're not, I don't know, you're not doing this, you're not doing that. It's not for like, you should do it. Like saying the basics, like the obvious, like I think anyone that's normally Muslim know 
that what they have to do and don't have to do, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Don't you think? Mm-hmm. Like, hey, don't we shouldn't drink, Actually, we shouldn't pork, eat pork. Yeah, most for the most part, yeah. Except for like, like it's a really basic yeah, stuff yeah. we know. So like, kind of saying it, parroting it to the person is not going to do anything, right? There's so many layers to it. There's so many like, you know, things to it that we have to unpack and get to the root of. Whereas it's not being done. So like for me. Going back to what you mentioned, Raf, like, I guess, like, what males should be, what females should be, like, yeah, that's good, like, you know, what res- responsibilities do a male have in a, in a um, I don't know, in a marriage, like, that's good, but then, like, for example, there was this conversation on Twitter, right, it was, like, um, male, like, males should take responsibility and should do this, 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 and there's not enough male m- men that are doing that. I'm, like, fine, okay, like, I, I th- that's your assessment, but for me, it's, like, Obviously, there's that and we have to do that. But then why aren't people or men doing that? Like, what is going on that's not facilitating that? For me, like, I think one of the things is like, for example, what's not talked about is stress and how people react to stress. So, like, I think me, you, you and me, Josh, uh, Josh, we talked about this, like, the sort of phlegmatic characters that uh, endure stress and how they react to that is like they become very, like, um, to themselves and is it in- reclusive inclusive like reclusive it, reclusive and reticent in a way like they don't they, they start to hold in rather than yeah and then how they release it they just like play video games all day and then it's like a way of dealing with that stress it's like an outlet for them to be in yeah, that yeah, world yeah. so that they don't have to ex- it's an outlet to ignore and pretend it doesn't exist and there was a, a talk that I don't want to mention the talk um, specifically because it was a decent talk but I noticed, like, it was about masculinity between two known figures in the community. They talked about masculinity, which is good and fine and all that, but then they kind of laughed at instances where it's like, you know, men are doing this and that and haha, you know, they're, they're just playing video games. Why are they just playing video? It's like, it's like this, that comment and that's it. But then there's so much layers to it where you have to unpack and get to the heart of. And for me, that's what I find is more interesting. Because it's like the, it's dealing with the reality. And once you deal with the reality, it's like, okay, now what can we do to facilitate better growth? Because at the end of the day, me, there's just as like there's different types of personalities of people within, you know, the male species, I don't know, to gender. Yeah. Same thing with females. There's different varieties of personalities, right? So like you have to cater accordingly. You can't just say all men are like this, all women are like that. It's a lot more like, um, you know, very... Um, diverse conversation that needs to be had very you know tailored as well to each person each like archetype and personality and and then understanding how they look at the world and then catering things accordingly and then understanding why they behave in a certain way does that make sense so like especially like for example someone gets angry and we sort of judge them like hey why are they angry the the crappy person or whatever but then there's so many underlying factors to that that makes them act angry in that moment that we have to factor in and address Whereas if we just, like, it's like what we talked about the top episode, it's like we're only addressing things, what we perceive on the surface level, right? So I just, my personal, like, interest and my personal fascination is, like, unpacking what's underneath that, like, unraveling what leads them to that action. Because at the end of the day, Islam's, like, about intentions, right? It's not about, like, the actual outcome in of itself, right? So we have to, like, focus on that aspect, right? Mm-hmm. Well, Sorry, I, think, I, I, think I sort of did a monologue What there, you're but. saying is that, as in community discussions about gender, um, politics, everything, it's just focused around every like they just preach the standard. As in, like, ah, oh, um, women have these rights. These are the amazing rights that Islam gave. But the fact of the matter is, those rights aren't being given. So, yeah. as in, like, the standard doesn't matter. Like you're saying, like, oh, men have to be this. The Prophet Sallallahu was like this. Mm-hmm. But like that productive, it's just an ideal that productive space for discussion. Like, why? aren't the men there as in they don't actually discuss yeah. that particular you have to be that. like that like they cross the boundaries they just preach like that's what you should be but men in their current state like with like tiktok video games i don't know like hyper toxic culture like how do they do that like and i think that's exactly what you're saying with um unpacking what it is in about modern society and men today that lead them to play video games all day or lead them to i don't know be angry or like um have certain expectations in of marriage and stuff like that whatever it may be but yeah as in uh, as in like what you're saying about only the standard being preached and the unpacking not happening i think that's across the board and take a lot of the community discourse on everything and these discussions are just uh, 
simply put down to polarization, man. Mm. I think that one group of people with a certain like-mindedness uh, or a certain inherent disposition or perhaps a, a socio-economic background or educational background will uh, have a certain set of ideas than, uh, that they're passionate about and they really believe are the um, prophetic ideals. And then another team, another group uh, will hear that or, or you know, be exposed to that. And as a result, they they feel a, a natural disgust response almost because their maybe their educational background is different or their uh, disposition is different. Their attitude to these things uh, when in their families and where they grew up and in their culture is different. And so when they see someone claiming the prophetic mantle to be a certain way, they're, they're horrified and they see it as a corruption. Uh, and then in that, there's a lot there's there's a lot of choice words and a lot of um bitterness and personal ad, ad hominem attacks and uh, what happens then it's just a vicious cycle it, it, after that after someone's hurt offended angry um there's no possibility to transcend that and i i, I you know i remember like in lockdown last year on clubhouse and these debates happened every day every yeah. day and you never got past the the uh, straw manning and the bashing that happen to throw in something you know that t that group of people that you know do the chest beating and waving the flag of islam and saying you know to others like this is what you should be like be the prophetic way this and that right do you find that perhaps they're doing it out of their own sort of natural disposition of um making people like succumb to their perspective which is like ideals based uh, sorry like more principled like approach like you have to be this, why aren't you this, right? And then sometimes it can also stem from a perspective where it's like the ego, like kind of, it's almost like maybe the, unconsciously or however it may pan out where it's like, if essentially what they're saying is like, we're better than you. Like I think I know what way. you're saying, but I think at the same time, uh, both um, camps are capable of, of that kind of demeanor toward the other. And there's, I don't, I don't necessarily believe that that one, although there is definitely sort of the, we we know for example that, and to to be sort of, um, how would you say it, to be completely disregard those people who who don't like the four temperaments, we know that the common ideal, like those those popular ideals of masculinity that we mentioned before, and the 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 triumvirate, what do you call it, the um. The trinity of uh, of sport, of of women, and of uh, gym, physical prowess. Uh, that they're very cleric sort of things, and and mas uh, traditional ideas of masculinity that are peddled there are, are much in much more in line with the sort of domineering, dominant, hot headed types of individuals, and the, that that obviously links to principle based um, outlooks, but. So we know that we acknowledge that's the case, but at the same time, I see individuals who are also the firebrand types um, countering those, and it's the same attitude and the same approach that they're uh, offended by that they can also adopt in their refutations, and that's what I mean about I can sum it up by just describing it as polarization, bro. Every political thing, every time there's a political discussion, and it's it is never devoid of uh, any really deep. Um, emotion and uh, as some people would put it trauma and I don't I don't think that it's fair for myself or anyone else to actually look there look at them and say well you know you guys are just uh, traumatized uh, like why can't you have a sensible conversation why can't you have a civilized conversation first of all that's kind of liberal of me because it's like why is it necessarily the case that truth is established I'm, I've, I've accepted the assumption that the dialectic leads to truth which is a, a liberal western ideal right uh, it's not necessarily like something that we believe in our tradition. So I can't, first of all, from an Islamic perspective, I can't look at people who are clearly emotional and angry about something in a debate or in a discussion and be like, ha, oh, why are you so stupid? Why don't you just like stop being emotional about it? Because one, it's not necessarily the case that some kind of rational, pragmatic conversation is, is going to bring me to the truth. Uh, oftentimes, as I've mentioned with Ibn Hazm and some of those stories, um, the individuals who won debates historically were individuals who were better debaters, more charismatic, better liked, mm. more skillful in the way of speaking. And that's the case today still. <clears throat> so the, first of all, I don't know whether these conversations have a point. Mm. Um, 
maybe they do, maybe they don't. Maybe it's liberal of me to suggest that they have to happen. And second of all, bro, like I just because I am in a privileged position to be able to sit there and say like, okay, I can analyze these things maybe with a more scholarly perspective, even though I'm not a scholar, but like having learned from scholars, I understand how scholars analyze things. And so I can look at things from that perspective and apply that lens to it because I've been um, privileged enough to have an education and to have come from a background where perhaps the injustices and the pain that a lot of Muslims had growing up when you know they were even reminded that they had to be reminded of their Muslimness by being called by their last name and shit like that. Mm-hmm. I never had to experience that. So having not experienced that, it's like going in someone being like, oh, you know, who's been through a war. Oh, you know, why are you so shocked? What's wrong with you? It's tough, bro. It is tough. Like Muslim, Muslim life is difficult and it's kind of patronizing of me. And I, I've had a problem with converts who have done it in the past. It's like you don't inherit that just by converting to Islam. So this, this reminds me, like, basically like Jordan Peterson's like, video that he did. yeah just just stop fighting with the shit just find a shit <laughs> find a shit pen pal oh my days like it's just devoid of that reality oh for Muslims, my God, right bro. and he's like diagnosing the muslim community in terms of what they should and shouldn't do right it's it's horrific man it's horrific it, it is the jordan peterson attitude though sometimes these conversations are just never going to happen bro the conversations that you want to happen the conversations that they want to happen is just not going to happen like And maybe we just stop waiting for it. So when it comes to what is solving masculinity, for example, I just I just don't think it's gonna happen. (laughs) What is Islamic masculinity? I think that everyone who is is capable just does their utmost, does their utmost and and strives as much as they can to uh, seek knowledge. And um, again, this is a liberal. This is me being liberal again. Like, oh, just go seek knowledge and it'll fix it. That's not how it works. But if you can. Seek knowledge um, and come to understand what is uh, what we call matters that are necessarily known in deen. So that you have to know the things like what is necessarily known in the deen and in sharia about what it means to be a husband and a father. Know those things. Know those things. And in the khilaf things, just try and have adab. But again, I, I know that me saying this comes from a very particular perspective and I'm viewing things for a very particular mm. prism that I can't expect everyone to just look through. I think for me, um, touching on the seeking knowledge aspect, I think what's also missing sometimes is that humility aspect and also um, understanding that Islam isn't just contained within, you know, fiqh, you know, hadith, you know, theology, aqidah. Like Islam, when it comes to the study of Islam, it branches out in many different facets of like even the so-called secular knowledge that people you know seek out in university so incorporates all of that so i think what happens is that kind of you know it's like being secular like you've only just established islam there's no such thing as the secular so like like you know what i mean right yeah and so for us it's like that humility that okay there's probably much more knowledge that needs to be acquired right and then being able to take that in factor it in and then using that accordingly with obviously islamic principles and having that humility that okay there's probably more knowledge out there that I don't know of and then listen in. Because I feel like, for me, I don't know if this is your experience, Raf or Josh, but like I've come across a lot of traditionalists. It's like they're very quick to shut down whatever we say. They have a very like almost, I don't know, JP outlook. And it's what happens is, I this is my theory, right? I'm going to throw it out the can of worms. I'm going to open it. It's not really that controversial, but it's like, I think this kind of purity of, hey, I'm just going to study the tradition, fiqh, hadith, aqidah, and somehow I have this Puritan understanding of Islam that's truly Islamic. It's just going to emerge suddenly, right? I find that people will latch onto evidences that that fits their um, preconceived ideas, and that's what they project Islam to be. Does naturally, that make sense? Naturally, they will. Yeah, yeah. That's, I guess that's for me as well, right? Like, I don't think anyone's like, you know, everyone will it's succumb to it. possible to, yeah. But I find that with a lot of people, a lot of traditions that have this kind of DEH-esque outlook or JP-esque outlook, it's like they use Islamic sort of justifications and it becomes like, it, I don't know if it's you know unconscious or whatever, but they'll project it as this is Islam. Of right? course, that's the whole point. And that's why it's so emotional. Because when I come and say that I disagree with your idea of, uh, for example, I disagree with your uh, idea on, I mean, and I don't necessarily, but if someone has a different idea of what it means to be a man in Islam, 
Yeah, to me. Man in Islam. Like a, like a rap. Rajul. Yeah, Rajula. Um, if someone has a different idea of that to me about what's fundamental, when I come and I state my idea, I'm not just saying my opinion on something. They're offended because it's blasphemous because what I'm actually saying is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded. It's like, do you know what I mean? Like we're debating over something sacred. And so that's why it's polarizing because if I see someone who I disagree with, my instant feeling and reaction is they're defecating upon the sacred. If we talk about things like, um, like it, 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 it's confusing to me um, how the debates around critical race theory rage on still to this day. I, I honestly, I think that some of them moving past it, like I was listening to Mad Mamluks the other day, for example, and I think one of them, I think it was Murtaza was even saying like, you know, I see now there are parts of CIT that Muslims can utilize. Like they, it's sort of, we've, we've moved past the fixation on that. But for example, when ideas and, and like, if you hear um, the reactionary individuals talk about CRT and the incursion of CRT into the deen and to the Muslim discourse, they'll see it as an offense, uh, offensive act or an incursion upon the tradition yeah. and upon the haq. Um, and so that's why it's so polarizing as well. You have to understand that we're not just dealing with, you know, some abstract intellectual thing where we're dealing with what we each stake our claim to be al- al-Islam, yeah. what Allah has revealed, in a way. That's how people see it. Yeah. Even with the critical race, there was a interesting video that happened by a certain somebody in a certain organ. Oh, man. So, like, even with that, that I guess... That got slammed, though, actually. Yeah, he did. Comments, he, everyone was yeah, just like, yeah, yeah. what are you doing? Why and would you ask uh, someone who has no knowledge of that area about it? As if it's speaking with authority almost in some ways, like, even okay. though like it, like what we know what was just dis- actually discussed in the video wasn't, you know. Yeah, I know. Th- I know flash, to uh, I've met Dr. Muhammad Gillen, we all have, and I know he's a knowledgeable man and he has a great deal of uh, insight to offer in the fields of neuroscience. Um, and there's no doubting his credentials in neuroscience. However, uh, I don't know how much knowledge he has of critical race theory. I think... Um, for me, that I find really problematic is why they still harp on about, you know, that whole idea that, okay, Allah has created this world in a certain way. And then what happens is like these I don't know, critical race theorists are trying to, um, you know, seek justice. And it's like going against what Allah has ordained. Yeah, so yeah, you, yeah, so is that that argument? Like, it, I don't understand like, how... Allah, like, yeah. Is that, does that make sense? Do you like, Bro, it makes sense <clears throat> if you understand that you will... You will, your brain will find any way to refute these people. But it, do you know what I mean? But it's it's it. No, no, no but the problem. What I'm saying is like, if people from, that are speaking from the tradition, right, are saying these statements, mm. I'm just like, what sirah are they reading? Mm. Like, what was Rasulullah Sallam's like whole project, bro? Like, you know what I mean? Like, it doesn't. Say, um, I, th- I think the counterpoint would just be like, oh, but you know, it's Russell Sam's prophet. These guys, they, I don't know, they're just confused. They're critical race yeah. Yeah, yeah, that it's gonna go down that rabbit hole. But he is not their priority. <laughs> that's what they'll say. <laughs> but that's the thing, right? In the Sira, it's the instances where Russell Sam, like you know, we know that, like, um, for example, like the lead up to, I guess, the Ansar um, giving Bayat to Russell Sam was the Wars of Buath, right? So that favored the Muslims. There's like um, Hilfa Fudul for example. So like there's so many instances in the Sira where you can actually find kind of these instances. Like the, I'm not here to just be like, okay, I've got the truth and that's it. I just want to make the discussion with more depth, right? Because it seems like there's this kind of attitude where it's like, I have this all figured out. I don't know, just follow Quran. Like I, I think I said in the, one of the WhatsApp threads, it's like, why does suddenly like Sufi sound so Salafi when it comes to these issues? Yeah. It's like, it just seems so simplistic, right? Like, and for no reason. Uh, that, that's like, what um, Raf is saying, that the impulse is from the same place, just from the is. opposite end yeah, of yeah. the spectrum. It's no, like it's the same right. sort of, like, um, Puritan impulse. Like, we want to um, preserve the deen. And um, La- Raf is saying, because it's seen as an incursion on the sacred, it's even more vicious than, like, your average See, it left comes, versus it's, right it's debate. It's met with it's, the same fervor that, a jihad would render. Yeah, yeah. As in religious, that's why religious discussions get so heated because it's like you're transgressing against that's God. Like, yeah, and then it comes. It's almost like they're trying to justify capitalism, right? In that sense, yeah. yeah. So, and so in, the, that, in, in that clip with Muhammad Gilan, like he's like, these people have a problem with Qadr, like Allah's created the world a certain yeah. way, and therefore, like they have a problem with Allah's creation. Who it's are like, these people? <laughs> no, no, but it's like, like, but, like. 
like if a child dies in a car crash because of a drunk driver or Allah just made it that way, it's like, no, there's real legal and I don't know, re- regulatory um, requirements in place such that that doesn't happen. Like, okay, so we shouldn't have traffic rules at all or like, um, I don't know, licenses and stuff because um, or even, that's just how like that's actually it. good that's actually very good you can example. use anything yeah so like for example let's just say I don't know that driver gets off the hook because of the systems and laws they're in yeah exactly right? so then it's the like yeah, hey yeah. but it's like Allah's qadr like we shouldn't mess with it yeah, yeah, yeah. but then what the activists should be doing or what Muslims should be doing is fighting like I guess the system and getting the rights accordingly because of uh, what happened right like yeah. for example the people have to Pay, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what do you call it? like pay the family that you know su- suffer, get compensating and stuff like that. So like, this is what I mean. Like that's actually a good example that you brought up. But it's like, it's like what you're making about other. But then a it's, whole that's why Sharia exists. It's a legal system because people do wrong things yeah. and there's ways to redress it. So if you're saying Allah has created the world a certain way in that clip, and we shouldn't strive to change it, that means you're saying that every structure that exists in place right now is as Allah wanted it. That but looks, you just be spiritual and sit at home and yeah, like oh yeah, like the it. U.S. Um, trade system. It's okay. Allah wanted it that way. We shouldn't say anything about it. Like, <laughs> like, what, what, like the I don't know the military industrial complex, like Iraq war. Everything Allah wanted it that way. So it doesn't. There's no consistency. It's yeah, like, it doesn't. It doesn't make. And it's, it's like, not even the reason the Sira, right? why people are vocal about certain issues is because they see an injustice and it doesn't meet their idea of what Islam demands in terms of justice in the world that's why they're vocal about it so it's like it's weird they're trying to draw exclusion like nah you're not abiding by Allah's qadr but it's in reality it's the opposite it's but like, like I said it's irrelevant to keep fixating on that because the real question is what makes an intelligent an otherwise intelligent person have such like make an argument with such glaring issues that even three random lay guys in Villawood can uh, point poke holes in why? Why are they doing that? Why are they not capable? It's because of polarization. It's because of demagoguery. Something is ignited in them where they're blinded by such a, a fervor, by such a hatred for something. The evil Marxist postmodernist. Yeah, like uh, they're, secular they're, they're like they will they say it to Muslims and anything, anything to see that enemy silenced because that enemy is the real enemy of Al Islam, mm, of exactly. of the, of the Muslimin. Like that's the real and look. Bro, I was thinking, um, you know, reminded of two things. First of all, like, not that my opinion carries any weight, but most of the time when it comes to these issues, if you if you've ever any, anyone listens to the podcast, they'll notice like a lot of my takes on um, things to do with like gender and uh, quote unquote postmodernism, whatever that means. Um, the degenerate. My, post-modernism. Most of my takes on these things are sort of I mumble on like yeah, one hand this on one hand that, but I don't know who am I even to talk anyway. I have that attitude. When it comes to critical race theory, I don't have that attitude. I'm 100% sure that people need to take it seriously. Mm. Like, I don't know how much I can speak on the gender debate. I don't know how much I can speak on these some of the sort of hot topics and the hot takes that, that we see in the Muslim community uh, discussed frequently on your little clubhouse chats, right? I don't know. Some of them are very complicated, and I don't think I have a right to an opinion. But when it comes to critical race theory, um, I, I do believe very strongly that it's something that Muslims need to consider and take seriously, and there's no agree, yeah. there's no room for any other anyone who just b- flat out rejects it and comes up with things like that is blinded by something. And uh, and as I said, in a way, I can forgive them. I can do husnadan and say, well, clearly the izza for the deen mm. is is making it mm. impossible for them to to see past uh, see past their own um, biases and see past and the the prism through which they view the deen is so. Um, myopic that they can't conceive of another perspective i understand that but like you mentioned you mentioned amazing like uh, examples of how there are so many issues with the attitude of just leaving it to allah's god bro mm. in a in a dars recently it was a fiqh dars it wasn't even like anything more complex than that the sheikh was talking about how um imam abu hanifa supported uh i've got it in my notes the revolution of um zain al-abidin not mm. zain al-abidin of, of imam like the the zaidi imam Imam Zaid uh, supported the Zaidi. He supported the Zaidi uprising. Um, he supported uh, Muhammad uh, ibn ibn al Hanafiya. So Muhammad Nafs al Zakiya, they called him. His mm-hmm. uprising. He supported that, and he supported uh, as well uh, the Abbasid revolution. He he was he was quite active in in these things. Imam Malik also um, was said to have supported 
the uh, revolution of Muhammad ibn Nafs al Zakiya, or Nafs al Zakiya, Muhammad Nafs al Zakiya, like he supported that. And this is these are the imams who are the imams of everyone. Oh, uh, so the the giant imams they like like the four imams that like shaped Islam yeah. as it is. They took political positions. Yes, even though it's, it's a lie that they didn't. They, it's a lie. They had conditions. Sure, like uh, Abu Hanifa is said to have five conditions um, in which it's permissible to support a revolution. One. Or, or permissible to rebel against the government. One, mm. the government must be genuinely uh, contrary to Sharia and, and unjust and tyrannical. But there's even ikhtilaf on whether the ruler himself, if the ruler is a fasik, whether you can rebel on, against him. Some say you can rebel against him. Some say that's not grounds enough. Even if the ruler is openly like um, uh, anti, like is openly sinning. The other conditions are you have to have the means to overthrow the government. Like mm. you, me, and Josh, like we can't just go <laughs> and march on, 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 like, um, what do you call it, Parliament House with pitchforks and be like, we're going to take down. The you have to have the means so and you have to have the support. Like a military general. Or yeah, like you have to have an army, a considerable army that, that can match or defeat the enemy army. Mm. You have to have a replacement plan. Okay. You have to have clear conditions in place as to like why you do better. Is, yeah. Is cool. These are the five conditions. Okay. And the other one is that the overall outcome must be better. For the for the com like for the people for the right. citizens than it currently is, it, those are the conditions for which it's permissible to. That's rebel. cool because that right there is a traditional narrative for a radical politics. You yes. could say because the whole way it's presented is that all oh, this radical politics is anti tradition, anti Islam. Mm. So what you're saying there is actually pretty um profound. And what's his so name? So why you know Abu Hanifa and Imam Malik um go against color? That's it. That's it. You open that kind of one. I don't. I don't know if I should follow them. What's his name? Um, other me Anjum. I was. He he did a recent like a lecture presentation. He's talking about how the um accepted with Wal Halak. No, no, no. Sorry, it was just some random bloke. Philip, like Philip, the greatest Muslim that never was. The it was some random online personality, but he was saying he was pretty much breaking down why that traditional wisdom that hadith like. Do not rebel against your rulers. Yeah. Or do you know that cl classic one that's always yeah, quoted? Yeah, the, the Salafis. Yeah, yeah. As um, the by the traditionalists, they're like, do not um, rebel against your rulers. Um, for like, I don't know, it'll lead to. Well, well, what is the exact hadith? But it's one that's always quoted. But he was just breaking it down. He's like, no, there's other like approaches taken by scholars throughout the centuries, like where Bills you can support that, revolutions. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And even like I mentioned in the example, Imam Malik and Imam Abu Hanifa. Um. They both had difference of opinion. Like they didn't. I mean, Imam Malik was obviously a bit younger than Abu Hanifa, and so he wasn't as politically active uh, in in with the earlier revolutions. But he certainly wasn't as vocal and as committed in his support of them as Abu Hanifa was. And there's a lot of factors for that. Abu Hanifa was in Kufa. He wasn't an Arab. Um, whereas Imam he Malik spent spent all his life in in Medina, pretty much. So it's not it's not like the there was an, a spectrum of um, opinions there. Like there is on most compl uh, complicated and convoluted issues, but there's definitely a precedent or a mandate for a radical politics. Yeah, there um, you go. I said we need a thick booklet for that. Like, what are the positions of the four imams on um, revolution, a protest? Radical that being change? said, it's a spectrum. Like on one extreme, there's Kharijism, which is like any reason, bro. I saw the um, I saw the. The Imam of the Muslims, the Amir al Mu'min, eating a Tim Tam. Tim Tams contain um, dubious uh, substances that may be haram. Yeah. Henceforth, we have to overthrow him because he ate a Tim Tam. <laughs> Henceforth. Like, no, but literally, like anyone who commits a sin um, is, is like. The alcohol has not evaporated, yeah, so it is time to it. pick up the sword. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, that, yeah, that's obviously a joke, but they, the Kharijis are pretty extreme, right? <laughs> Just in case we have Kharijis in the audience, I have to be I have to be thoughtful. Uh, and then you have the Madkhali side, like on the other end, where it's like the guy can literally just be locking all the ulama in jail, um, and us and the ulama in jail themselves. Like some of them will even be like, no, no, just support the ruler. Like you have to support the ruler. Um, There's a saying about the the Saudi regime where it's like, um, if you want to go learn your deen in Saudi Arabia, you have to go to jail. Because that's where all the good scholars are. Yeah, yeah, I've heard, I've heard that quite a bit. Yeah, um, what do you call? Um, Tanzim, just to backtrack to your earlier point about you're talking about um, the Puritan impulse about how traditionalists um, mm. just think you have your fiqh, your hadith, and then you're good. Like you've studied it by yourself with the scholars, and you're good. Like you can just live with it. 
Like that's really interesting to me because um, it's like living Islam in a bubble sort of way. Yeah. Like yes. you'll make absolutely zero effort to translate your knowledge to the common people, to the masses, because fifty percent of the community like don't even practice. Eighty percent like aren't on the same wave that you're on, or ninety percent. So you're just gonna live in your like two percent bubble and like never like I think that's engage Islam. with like the young people or like make Islam easier to understand for them. Instead you're just gonna preach this traditional standard and be like, nah, I'm good. But that's what happens. And then everyone me. else is sort but that's of like exactly what wayward. So I'm like, I don't get it. All right. They can live in their bubble, but like two, three generations in the West, their kids not gonna maintain it. Like it's hard enough for us, right? So it's like if you don't make it relatable to your kids and young people in the generation and make them understand how Islam is relevant instead of just preaching the traditional standard. It's like, like nah, women should never go out, never go to masjid, nothing, nah, end of story. As in, that's probably what um, the Hanafi Fiqh books say. Yeah. Loki, it, probably, it does say that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But if, if you leave it at that and you're like, nah, that's what the Fiqh book says, that's what we live by, then you just alienated like 98% of women and the deen is not relatable and they'll just discard the it. The not even being taught properly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So, so how are you going to... They, if, you, if you just if you just pick up, the at all. pick up from the lines like in the book like medieval books it's not exactly applicable. I, I search it up on YouTube and some Salafi shit screaming at my face <laughs> but yeah I feel like if if people like aren't gonna make an effort to engage with the culture and translate like the Dean for a young modern audience then it's like you're making yourself irrelevant there's no point like as in you can just live in your bubble then just leave it be Cause, but if you're trying to like make it a mass thing where you're trying to get non-practicing Muslims practicing again. That's that's a lot bigger like task. Like it's a, it's much bigger um, obstacle to face because you're actually having to cross that barrier and make Islam relevant and get your brothers, sisters, cousins back into Dean and practicing. And there's so much more effort that goes into that. Like From emotional their perspective, sensitivity, the, everything. Um, they take the hadith of the end of times where. Um, the process of advice that it would be better just to sort of run for the hills. Isn't there also the hadith that the person that's retreated to the hills, Allah tells the angels, like, destroy him first? I've not heard that. You haven't I've heard that? I've not heard that, no. It's like a people withdraw, um, someone withdraws from the people saying that they are corrupt, and then when the end of time comes, it's like, destroy him first because he's withdrawn from the people, and he sees himself as above it all. As in, that's a hadith. Uh, like I'm, I'm butchering the actual hadith, but no, no, there's some, there's something along those lines that I've heard repeated, like by Hamza Yusuf, like big scholars. Um, start with him first. As in, that's that's like one of the punchlines, so to speak. It's end of. There's, uh, there's, I think we've touched on it in a previous podcast, but this end of times narrative gets really like uh, into the minds of the Muslims, where they're just like pretty much yeah, as you were saying. Run for the hills or whatever. Or that kind of attitude. It's like not... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like it, it almost well, justifies it. Because it's, it's it. easier. Yeah. It's easy for me to say, like, you know what? Everyone is... Everyone is cooked. <laughs> you know, that 80% of the Muslim population that, that don't know the first thing about Islam and, and don't care, um, they're cooked. And I can mm. save myself mm. on the Yom al But the, the reality is, if, if you're a person of... Uh, gravitas of power of presence of knowledge of wisdom then you will be able to transform communities and mm. the rewards that you'll get um inshallah if your intentions 100%. are good are so much better so than the like, rewards you get for saving yourself bro, like how, how the hadith that Rasul some said like um alluding to the future muslims like those are my was it close companions or friends and the sahaba like um Aren't we your like close companions? And like, no, you're my companions, but my companions are those that believe in me who haven't seen me, right? And then we have like, for example, mm. uh, Abu Huraira radiyanhu, who we know that because he was part of Ahl Sufa, he really sacrificed a lot in the sense of sticking close by to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and gaining knowledge and hadith yeah, and yeah. disseminating that right and people question like why did he narrate how did he narrate so much hadith but he said that because he actually um it was almost like almost post khaybar a battle of khaybar that's when he was like part of the muslim so that's like really late i guess oh really it was that late yeah it was oh, pretty late I didn't know. okay but the thing is at that time muslims were obviously in a world good established financial position and he em- stressed and emphasized that I literally stuck to the Prophet some like 
all day and day night. Day and night, yeah. Because like you have the Sahaba that like having to work in the fields or st- stuff like that, and then they don't have that as much time with the Prophet. Yeah. So he was literally day and night with his hungry stomach yeah, yeah. close by to Rasulullah. So like the immense dedication that he you know showed and alhamdulillah like how much we benefit there's from always that, right? there yeah. there's always there so like bring it to now like i think it's always always a responsibility um especially in the times that we live in especially if you're muslim and you're practicing right and you've you know tasted the the sweetness of iman you've tasted it right um you do i f- this is my um opinion that you do have a responsibility. To, well, obviously, it's in, it's said in the tradition, giving dawah and spreading Islam, all that. But you have an extra responsibility, especially in this day and age, mm, mm, especially yeah. in the sense of akhlaq, right? Um, making sure that your adab's on point and doing it in the best that you can. Obviously, there's different contexts where that may need to change according to who you're speaking to or whatnot. But for the most part, you should have that kind of emotional intelligence and also disseminating Islam accordingly to and, mm. and you know, making yeah. that sacrifice because it's... It, it's not easy, man. It's like, bro. Speaking of um, emotional intelligence, so I feel like that whole appeal of like run for the hills, just live in your exclusionary bubble. Like, I feel like there's a certain appeal to the ego that has, like, just living in opposition to like the wider community. Be like, nah, most people are misguided, but me and just my mates and my clique and my small community here, we're guided because we follow this ideology or we're staunchly traditional. There's a certain appeal to the ego you get. Like ex- having that exclusionary attitude towards other Muslims, because you're like, nah, we're the saved ones. Nah, we have a um, connection to the actual shuyukh, like over Skype in Oman or whatever. Um, do you know what I mean? As in, like, just living with that oppositional attitude, it gratifies the ego in some way. I feel like, but having to deal with like, like these 19 year old Muslims, like in uni with everyone's diverse, like I don't know, sinning and their desires and like the problems that Muslim have, it's so much harder, right? Because you have to have that patience in dealing with, I don't know, your sister or your cousin who isn't practicing. And like, you're like, how do I actually like help them come closer to Dean, right? But if you just leave with the, if you live with the exclusionary attitude, you're like, nah, it's on them. Like, nah, it's not on me. Like, I don't have to guide people. I don't have to make Islam palatable to them and show them the beauty of the Dean. Like, I'm saved, I'm good. But to actually engage with the wider community is so much harder, like 100%. Like people who have that patience, emotional intelligence to um, not drive people away, but bring them closer to the dean, that's special. Like not many people have that, I reckon. Uh, like, And you see it in terms of da'is as well. Like people, like those who preach like exclusionary, an exclusionary message and those who like, like are like everyone come, like bring whatever baggage, whatever sins you have and like come to the fold of like, Allah and his prophet so I saw him. So, as in like there's like you, you you feel that I feel like you can feel that with like um different days different scholars etc so you know uh, it's a very complex discussion at the very least and I think that it really just comes down to you you do have to convey the message you do as a Muslim you have to give da'wah um, convey from me even if it is one verse you know mm, mm. Um, every Muslim has a mandate to do so I think the problem is people are lazy and they don't want to take the time to think about what the best way to do that is in a particular context. Allah appoints all things, right? He mm. appointed that we be here on this corner of the earth, in this you know place, for a reason. If we have knowledge at some point in our lives, uh, any knowledge, then it's because Allah decreed it to be so. And there's a purpose for that. And I believe that purpose is to some extent utilitarian in that we all have a a function to fulfill not just to ourselves but to the society in general and to the muslims in general we you know they almost the idea of far kifaya like we need doctors we need engineers but we also need very skillful tactical da'is who are acquainted with the condition of their people the language of the people and can speak and convey islam in a way that the people can it can mm. re- it can resonate with them. Mm-hmm. I I find it uh, really disturbing. Like I remember reading a post uh, recently where uh, a sister was talking about how the every time she went to the masjid for Juma or whatever with her husband, she would be like, "I can't stand here anymore. Like this khutbah is is just or this talk, or this lecture is just ridiculous, right?" And it's often something that that they a lot of the Muslims agree, right? At, at this masjid. It's the local masjid, and 
they they like come on like like she'll text her husband and be like we gotta go like I can't I can't listen to this and he'll be like no please can we stay it's hilarious <laughs> <laughs> but it's true like there are so many jumas I go to and I go back because it was hilarious and the sheikhs are like blasting women it's like the sheikh was uh, one point there's one one that I love the most like I kept going back to it. it's bad like it's sadistic in a way sadomasochistic view of my own deen um, where like I go there. Because I know the shit, like he gets so angry, like his veins start pumping out before he's <laughs> raging, right? Over like, the prayer of the Prophet, as if you see it, as narrated in Nasr al-Din al-Albani. Like, Rahim Allah, may Allah have mercy upon his soul, mm, is mm, to keep. Mm. And then he describes the prayer of the Prophet according to uh, Nasr al-Din al-Albani. Mm. So like, that's that's it. Like, the whole thing was just berating people who, who had prayed differently. So I went, I was in the front row and I prayed, obviously, according to the way of the Malikiyah. Like to, to subvert him But the passion that he brought to it And the anger that, and, and, and the surety he had When speaking about this Like these, these Salafi talking points um, were, Was very entertaining for me <laughs> But in a way it's kind of depraved Because I've sort of in, in that Given up hope On the fact that I can find something Genuinely uplift Like maybe once mm. Every few weeks Every few months I actually go and I listen to a khutbah That's, that's beautiful or there's a lecture that's beautiful. Yeah. I, I want to throw a spy in the works. I, I, I mentioned this example to you before. You just remind me now. Like we're talking about making sure that we talk about Islam in a way where it's relevant to the modern day and age, right? Mm. So I think as well, when it comes to Islam, we need to obviously mold that accordingly to time and place in the society that we're in, right? So... One, uh, I've uh, I have this um, interest in Shawaliullah, Rahimullah, and um, Mujaddid of our times. I'm I'm strongly our time. Oh, who, like who? his time. Sorry, <laughs> our time. You talking about Numan Ali Khan? Are you talking about his time, not this time? Yeah, <laughs> he's lost a lot of Numan Ali Khan fans now. Yeah, so um, <laughs> nah, in, generally it might be. In, in in one sense of the word, yeah, yeah. So um, it means reviver, right? I just meant reviver generally. <laughs> yeah. So um, there's so many there's so many um examples to like I guess his weight, like his brother um his sorry his brother his um father was um famous. I forgot the names giving my mind, but he was the one that helped um compile. Was it um the um, Aurangzeb's um, Fatwa Al Mugiri. Yeah. So he, you know, had a premonition that um, at a lot older age, he had to um, get married again, and he said, "I have a premonition that I'm gonna give birth to a son, and he's gonna be a great scholar, or something like that." And it ha- obviously, it panned out. And then um, his father also forced him to get married very young, and people were like, "What are you doing? Like, you know, this and that." And he's like. I have a premonition that this must happen now. And what happened was like his, I think his all, lot of family, there was a lot of deaths. So that marriage actually helped like kind of preserve like the family situation, so to speak. So, you know, it's a lot of, I guess, yeah. Anyway, so like there's another interesting story. I don't, I think I shared it with you. Um, he, um, I don't know why I'm going to this tangent. I'll, I'll get to what I want. I just, mm. I'm just interested. I, mean, I just want to talk bro. about this. Like, I, I wish Anyways, I, no, no, no. Shah, Allah, did you know that he um, got taken yeah. to the jinn world? So the story goes that um, there was a snake and he killed the snake. And I think at night when he was sleeping, he got taken to the jinn world and he was summoned to the court of the jinn. And the, they, they were saying that um, you're summoned here because you killed a jinn. So the snake was apparently like taking the shape of the jinn and he killed it. And so he was in the court of the jinn. And so he pulled up, I think there's like a hadith where it says like, you know, the Muslim is like permitted to do this in this circumstance when the snake's here. So he, he knew his, you know, sort of um, ruling, so to speak, and was able to go out, get out of that um, situation. But what happened was there was apparently a jinn that was from the time of like the Sahaba, right? So he... Um, validated what um shawaliullah said and basically the wisdom as to that whole situation was that um shawaliullah gets called a tabi tabi because he's met a companion oh, wow. and so that whole event was just to make him tabi to 
elevate his his status, right? So that's a really fascinating story. It's in it's in a book about someone compiled like all these kind of like jinn stories and scholars' interaction with them and stuff like that. So, anyways, I'll go back to my point. So, I hope that justified why he's a great scholar. I don't know, but yeah. So, I think he's, um, his scholarship speaks for itself. You know, a lot of Salafis like um, claim him. Sufis claim him. It's really interesting. I, I find like he's a very he's a hybrid of both in some ways. I wouldn't, I'd bro. Honestly, if if there's one legacy I have in the world, it's to stop the Salafi Sufi dichotomy. Please, <laughs> please don't let me start. Anyways, with, please so just use different terms. Yeah. <laughs> Traditionalists. So the Ashaira and the uh, Taymian reformists. Taymian is good. Yeah, because he incorporated his works and, you know, works of mm. Ghazali and all that. But anyway, so like, um, and he also wrote about the temperaments. That's another story for another time. Mm. So I'll go to my main point. He wrote specifically in his works, I think it was his um, magnum opus, like his main works, where he said his critique of, he, had, he was very critical. A lot of like, like I'm reading um, Muhammad Iqbal, like he's criticized like, you know, um, Sufi lodges, like the Khankas and um, places of learning because it's like, it's just brain dead kind of learning. Like there's no passion, there's no zeal in the sense of emotion and all that. So it's just kind of like rote learning. So like similarly, what he also said, um, he said um, how people approached the Quran at that time was that they just studied the tafsir of the Quran, and that's it, right? So what happens is obviously it's written by great scholars and they just study that as if that's the only interpretation of the Quran. Does that make sense? But they don't go beyond that because what he proposes and states is that the Quran is a timeless book for all times and places, right? So if you're only subjugating, like I'm not diminishing the importance of tafsir that you know our ulama of, of, of the past you know wrote, right we take it in we learn and extract but it doesn't mean it stops there right you build on it you expand you 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 know you you sort of seek knowledge and see if you can add to it or, or whatever right so that's his how this criticism of his time i was really like i'm like blown away i'm like bro this is like i feel like he's speaking my language like, you know what i mean i feel like he's the traditionalist that i want to like kind of because like traditions won't like see it like that in my opinion so i feel like i align more with him in that sense so like he, he's saying that in his time. So he's like, we need to like read it with like fresh pair of eyes in the sense that, you know, there's certain situations. Because at his time, it was a very tumultuous time. When so did he like, live? Which century? Like, Sorry. Uh, the yeah. So at that time. 18th to 1700s yeah, like, in India. Well, yeah. yeah. Okay. That was a very like, you know, tricky situation politically speaking. And so it's like, you need to, you know, read things accordingly for its time and doing that legwork. But it wasn't there because it's like people kind of stuck, if that yep, makes sense. Yep, and we yep, see yep, this yep, pattern yep. now, to be honest. So it's like a a thing that happens uh, still happens mm, in our times mm. right it's like because you have that sort of very you know salafi approach like hey you know the companions you know obviously knew the prophets are some really closely intimately and that's the only way we're going to know the quran which is like true in this i'm not denying that but it's like there's more to it as well because of quran being a timeless book so one thing i, I wanted to throw i've been having some theories right I, I might as well throw it in now in terms of re possibly rereading certain aspects about the Quran. I got two, right? So one is I'm gonna throw it out there. You know Dulkanain, who's Dulkanain, right? There's that conversation, right? And there's also another place in the Quran where it talks about I think um you know how it uh, Allah criticizes the Jews like the Jews worship Christ um Christ and uh, sorry Christians worship Christ and the Jews worship I think Ezra or something like that. And there's a whole conversation of who's Ezra. And it was just like, I think that's his name. I have to pull up the, the Quranic. I haven't come across this passage. So anyways, there's, yeah. So there's, there's discussion about who's um, Ezra, who's this figure. Like mm. Jews don't actually mm. worship someone like this is new to us. So there's all this discussion and they've painted it to this Jewish figure that wrote a lot of, um, during the, t at, at his time, the Jewish scriptures were lost. So, he, had, he was actually responsible, one of the people that rewrote a lot of the um, scriptures and stuff like that. And so what the Islamic scholars tried to propose is that he um, was worshipped because of that or something to that effect to make that, draw that link, right? Like, which is fine. Like, I, I, it's not, I'm not saying it's right or wrong or whatever, right? I just take it. I'm like, okay, cool, right? But it's not like the huck is that. Does that make sense? It's like, there's a, it's, a, it's a scholarly discussion. There could be other interpretations who it is. So there's that room, wiggle room, right? So my theory, right, I was thinking about 
I'm thinking like for me, there's books on this as well. You know Akhenaten, the Egyptian first monotheist of Egypt. I'm like, why can't he be discussed as Dulkarnain, right? And I think there's a lot of validity to that, to be honest. It's my little theory. And about the whole, I think Ezra what was saying in the Quran. I was, <laughs> um, I think it's it's not actually that figure. I think it's more um, Osiris, the Egyptian god, or the son of the Egyptian god, or one of the gods. So, like, do you understand what I'm trying to do? Like, I'm just trying to reread things in, in a light where, obviously, Islamically, it's a permissible boundaries are there. But then it's like kind of throwing a lot more, you know, or discussion or making it more interesting in that sense where you have different knowledges or different, you know, aspects of looking at things and just kind of seeing if it fits the bill. Does that make sense? I think, yeah. The yeah, Quran it can be read like that. In so much as you, you can um, take a, like, when it comes to these khilaf matters in, in Akira, if you are researching it and you are a student of knowledge, then you are entitled to choose an opinion from the many classical opinions i don't think that any anyone you know in our sort of day and age or in our level can construct conceive of one originally but just because we wouldn't know all the all the evidences that are put forth course, or either yeah. yeah there's been like different interpretations of Zulkan and already right like cyrus um the, the most popular one alexandra, is, uh, I cyrus alexandra. The great. yeah and then um alexander as well Aliate said alexander the great mm. because and he said it's like a, a smoking gun, like it's very obvious based Indeed. on these expeditions or whatever. So I guess, I guess More stuff like this one for me. No, but he he was, was, you know, like, uh, I can't get into what do you say? The Chinese? Well, no, a, a lot of say it's the Khazars. The Khazars were a, a actually a Turkish Jewish tribe um, that lived beyond the Caucasus Mountains, where they, there was apparently a wall put up to like stop them, the nomads from coming down. Um, but these are yeah. There's a lot of interesting discussions about that. The Mongols is another one that comes up Mongols a bit in like classical, one, right? yeah, the classic Islamic history. The Some people said the Vikings. I think there's a couple of ulama who mentioned the Norse raiders. But um, yeah, there's a lot of the discussions and debates there. But I find that interesting too. The who is Yajuj and Majuj? I don't know. I've never really been like inclined to know who Dulkarnain is. But definitely, yeah, right. Jujumaj. I haven't I haven't looked into this since like the 2011 YouTube videos, like three three sixty p. As in, like, it's, it, it's been a long time since I was like interested in like oh, you know, had fast internet. I was one forty four p. These um, <laughs> you know, like, like everyone's trying to conjecture on like oh, who are these people and make it like relevant to the modern times. Section, yeah, you go down. Yeah, yeah, yeah and everyone's go, I was like oh, like and all and these conspiracy from the computer, I'm conspiracies like, and stuff. I'm, I'm an like, alim now. Yeah, I'm like <laughs> shit, I know something. Nothing else. Uh, nobody else knows. Yeah. But yeah, interesting stuff. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like, um, you know, I like Shah Wali Allah because he said oh, the, the yeah, Muatta. I, I, I knew you were going to go down this. You know, I have to. Was he a no? No, go go. He said it. the Muatta is, is superior to Sahih al Bukhari. Yeah, he did. Was was he a tasawwuf inclined? Well, yeah, he was. He was um, a. Uh, but he had a good balance. I like the balance where he felt that. Don't say that Salafis were. No, 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 no. Listen. I'm is he a scholar in the sense of like actually like as in like a hadith of fiqh giant or like yeah, yeah, it was yeah, like giant, okay. giant. Um, to the point where that? when he studied at Saudi, the one of the scholars, like the giant, giant scholars, was like, you know, I looked to Shah Wali to interpret like the hadith. I like kind of narrated uh, and all that, and he understands the inner dynamics and and meanings to it. And um, yeah, so back to what I was saying Saudi about the spiritual as in thing, the Ottoman Empire, like Arab region, as in like Mecca, Medina, like yeah. So he went um, and studied in Saudi and um, studied um, like even Taymiyyah's works and stuff. And yeah, right, he right, he right, right. he. Sort of brought the two together, so that's why like mm. many sal- mm. Salafis like see him as like that Salafi figure in the in the um, in in India basically. Yeah, but then yep, yep, yep. there's the everyone Sufis claims him claims, because he's yeah, so. But that's because but he's we, such. I a, don't. Like, I don't think you can put him that. He's such an indisputable right? paragon that every side needs Shawli Allah in any like every debate mm. on Islam in, in in the subcontinent today, like serious one between Ahl Hadith and um, yeah. and the. Uh, the Dilbandi and Badalvi establishment, they all appeal to Shah Wali Allah Dahlawi. You know, do you remember when um, we went to Subhra Ahmed, he said that, you know, someone's on the truth when all groups claim him. That's it. And he said that about Dr. Isra Ahmed. Do you remember this? Yeah. So that's really fascinating insight. Isra like, Ahmed is the tafsir Pakistani dude. Yeah. He's a Tanzimi. Yeah, he's a heavyweight. 
Um, oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, so where, where are we going? Oh, yeah, so um, in regards to spirituality, he was very against kind of making lay people subject to, like, you know, the strict sort of Sufi tariqa practices? So he was, he was again say it was just like there's a balance like people just need to follow like the basics of Islam and all Did that. Did he have Andrew. a tariqa? Yeah, he was. Yeah. He was a Naqshbandi, right? From memory, yeah. Yeah, it says it, it says he was Naqshbandi. That's interesting. Yeah, mm-hmm. no, he was he was a fascinating. Figure. I wish I'd read more about him. I know someone who's like studied his works a lot and has a very like he gave me a very brief sort of history of the Deobandi movement. Um, he's a good scholar and he was telling me about the history of the Deobandi movement and how. It's like everything sort of traces back to Shabali Allah. And it, even contemporary debates, you know how I mentioned like everyone has to invoke him in yeah. the sort of uh, intersectar- intersectarian debates. Even within the Dilbandi school, the debates are all about what Shabali Allah thought. Although some, some uh, Dilbandis disagree with him on things, um, especially like the introduction of and the respect, like the sort of um, how, not affinity, but like sort of respect he had and admiration he had for Ibn Taymiyyah's ideals. Mm. But how much is a question? This is a, this is a historical question, right? This is like some. This is like a juicy one. I like it. Someone asked me, and I was just like blown away. They asked, "What extent? To what extent do the does the emergence of the Diobandi movement, Ibn Taymiyyah's ideals, and even the movement of Ibn Abdul Wahhab, and if you extend that further west to like the West African Jihad period, to what extent?" Do those ideas derive from the tumultuous contexts that they came from? Mm. What do you think? That's what I mean. When someone asked me that question, I was just like, "Wow, that's a, that is a good question, right?" That that that, that like necessitates a thesis. Yeah. But I, I think that the, there's grounds for an analysis of like the troubled times leading to more radical. I mean, we said radical politics before, radical scholarship. <laughs> Uh, Abdul, That's just interesting, yeah. Was it troubled times during Abdul Wahhab? Because he was 1700s, right? That's when his crusades against the Arabs were. It was still traditional Arab society then, right? As in, in terms of the like Bedouin, yeah. imperial encroachment. Because the Obandi is very much imperial British were already dominating. Yeah, yeah. And Same with West the world Africa. world is so it's different. So in West Africa, it'd be in response Ibn to Taymiyyah colonial. Was the Mongols. Ibn Taymiyyah, yeah, right. Okay, okay. So yeah. they had different sort of pressures on society. But I think that, that you could say that. Maybe the oh, what's that? Is that not is that, is that the car alarm? Yeah, it's gone now. <clears throat> Ibn Abdul Wahhab was more of like a happenstance, indigenous. But that, the Prophet <clears throat> Sallallahu had the hadith about the Najd, right? Oh, it doesn't get into that. Oh my goodness! <laughs> the, as in, as in, I can't think of any external forces on Arabia in the 1700s. Or maybe my reading of history is poor. Yeah. But it seems very, a very indigenous Puritan impulse that mm. came out of a certain location because nah, of a certain because it was it was like he wasn't popular amongst the Bedouin necessarily. It it just so happened that a tribe that adopted his ideas happened to. The house of Saud, like the yeah, and he was just domineering. He yeah, just won over everyone, they right? just happened to do pretty well, and they ended up seizing Mecca. Militarily, like he reigned supreme, and then his idea spread. Like, exactly, and then it was like obviously still just sort of local until oil. So it's a very Arab Arab sort of revolt. Like it was crazy, right? Because it needed all of the the dominoes to fall in order for us to get to where we are today. And this is why this is my Arab criticism. Revolt. This is my criticism. Okay, like you know how I keep saying like don't use the Salafi Sufi dichotomy. Because they're not the same thing. Like it, it's a, it's a very, it is one of the most simplistic and anemic dichotomies that I've seen ever. I hate it so much. It boils my blood when people use it willy nilly. Like, oh, are you more Salafi or more Sufi? Or you know, why are you guys not? Uh, why are you guys so Sufi and not Salafi enough? Like, you need to be a balance because they're not two sides of the same coin, bro. Tasawwuf is a science of Islam. Ibn Abdul Wahhab said that himself. No alim has ever said, maybe, except for Ibn Hazm and a couple of the Zahiris of, of Andalusia, that Tasawwuf is not really like a science, yeah? So Tasawwuf means that. Salafism, what is Salafism? Tell me what Salafism is. What you're really talking about is the intellectual trend or the or the scholarly, like the, the legacy of scholars um, that post Ibn Abdul Wahhab. That revokes traditional scholarship yes okay. it's post ibn Wabdu, uh, like okay. you can trace pretty much all except for uh, there are a handful of hanabila who existed throughout history who uh, tried to commentate on ibn taymiyyah's ideals yep. 
but the ma- like the main like the incursion of of Salafi the modern or the existence of the Salafi phenomena today is purely derived from the success of Ibn Abd al-Wahhab's proselytizing and the political success of the House of Saud and financial success. They're not. That's not a sect, bro. It's not a valid, equally valid interpretation of Islam alongside Sufism. First of all, Sufism is a Western Oriental. The the dichotomy between Islam and Sufism is a Orientalist concept. Uh, Tim Winter talks about that when Western Orientalists wanted to come in and say, "Well, we like all this Sufi stuff. This is pretty lit." But oh man, that that lit, like Sharia oh, fit. That that no, we don't want that. It's from the 1800s. Yeah, like we we, we don't really want that. Sufi like we'll call that Islam, and then we'll take the Sufis. Sufi stuff and call that Sufism, right? Do you know this? It's actually fascinating you brought that up because um, when I did um, critical race theory classes with um, with um, Stagfurla Yasser Morsi, I don't know why I was in that class. Um, made a lot of Tawbah. Did but you retake your Shahada? <laughs> so, what we did, he gave a really good example. It's like this is in critical race theory in the sense that he brought this mm, example of mm. Jijek, right? Jijek uses this example of like um, decaffeinated coffee where it's like you just take out what you want from the coffee, right? Mm. I don't know how decaffeinated coffee works. Like how does it work? No caffeine. Yeah, so you uh, take out... Uh, osmosis. Yeah. It's you take out what you want basically, right? Yeah, yeah? yeah. So that's like Islam from the perspective of white people or whiteness, right? It's like they take out from Islam what they see... For, Oh, did he use that example? Okay, he used that example. Yeah, he used that example. So it's like it's like stripping away, right? One of the essential qualities of okay, yeah, and 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 fitting it to the 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 sort of um, the boundaries of whiteness. Does that make sense? And making it accepted within the West. Oh wow! Because they strip it away. So that's like Jijek actually uses that example, and so I guess you can use that example with Islam, right? Mm. You have the West strip away Islam. But only take out what they see benefit from their perspective, right? Which is what you just described is the Sufi. Oh my mm. gosh, like spirituality. Oh my gosh, mm. like, this is deep, man. This is deep, man. And then, man. Uh, so Sufism feels that um, Apollonian like fantasy vision yeah. of Islam. Like, oh, this is the true Islam. The Sufism, not even the poetry. true Islam. They they dichotomize it, and some say actually developed the idea of universal Sufism, which transcends Islam. It's like mm. the 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 spirit of all, the ruh of all. Do you, do you know? Do you know the Theosophical school? Yes, early 1900s. Gandhi was a part of it. Bro, okay, can we talk about this? Because I've been looking It's called the one. Theosophical Society of the UK. It's like all the like goofy Sufi types went there. Yeah. Idris Shah and them, like that, that era or a bit before it's, him. This is like, it's Gandhi, okay, early 1900s. Okay, this is a Jewish story. Go, As in, go. <laughs> in, in, in my Gandhi studies, he's that it's mentioned a lot. And that's where there's like a um, cross... Uh, what do you call a flourishing of ideas from the east, from the west, etc. I was literally reading text on that because I got interested in if <laughs> I got interested if um Gandhi is like a Western agent. <laughs> I, I, bro, you? there's a lot of weight to it. <laughs> so uh, hear me out, hear me out, yeah, yeah. hear me out. So pretty much, when he was in South Africa, he fought for the West. Yes, he did. Bowl. The British. Yeah. Yeah. And so in that case, he was the ambulance driver, apparently. Yeah, but he was a medical unit or something. Yeah. Like so it's like, how did he switch? But I guess in his biography, it's sort of what he, they painted it, right? They painted it as he had a transformation of ideas like later on, right? But then I guess his political sort of journey and how it um, panned out when he went back to India was just so like very fast and quick. Um, he was like he saw the condition of his people's sort of thing, like and saw the true nature. Yeah, of that, the so that's how it's painted, right? But yeah, then yeah. there's the other narrative. Where he's like a Western agent because if you actually look at like we did modern India in a, a, a uni, he actually delayed independence in the way of like his kind of pacifist approach. Yeah, that's true. So it's like, but I thought that was more like he was so set on the the satyagraha the the pacifist um it's like the Jain- Indian, that, that, Indian philosophy is like no no violence and then he shut it all down but that delayed things and then that, yeah, that's that made, delayed things yeah that's true but then it's not only just that it's like at the same time it's like how much of the west have propped him out even from the west like oh, oh my gosh I, I th- that might be like a Martin Luther King syndrome it's like after their death they're celebrated as the hero of that um, era because no, they're the pacifist it's one yeah but then that's problematic because, like, even in like you have academics now within that field, they actually say like pacifist politics shit. Yeah, yeah, 
Like that's how lecture. So the, the UNSW professor. Yeah. So she said that because there were other Indian revolutionaries that were suicide bombing the British officials yeah. and like assassinating them, that forced the British to deal with Gandhi. Do you get what I mean? Yeah. It forced them to negotiate with Gandhi because they didn't want to negotiate with the assassin, like as in like but the they think proper Gandhi radical Gandhi in of itself was the reason. Yeah, as in the popularity of his Gandhi's piece changed everything, but that's not true. That's just yeah, how like 100%. people view history, though. In general, uh, and they're like, that's, that's like the white. That's again that's the decaffeinated view, um, coffee. Um, but that that's just typical American sanitizing of history. Like after yeah, true, after yeah. MLK, they're like, oh, he was the greatest leader. He was so peaceful, but he wasn't. He was very radical. Yeah, and he like went towards violence sometimes as well. And then. Um, Nelson Mandela, they're like, oh, he's the greatest leader ever. He was like um, planting bombs in cars in South Africa, like killing white like civilians and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> like as in, like his tactics were very, very violent in the early stages. But his whole history is sanitized. Like, oh, he's this amazing, peaceful leader that brought an end to apartheid. And obviously, through the series, we know you have to fight to get the rights or yeah. yeah right. like, I'm not justifying all, all the methods you just described, but I'm saying that whole idea that yeah, yeah, pacifist yeah. politics is the way it's almost like, uh, this is like what we discussed in class as well. It's like that shedding away of actual rad- radical change, because when you're just sort of mm. entrenched mm. in that sort of ideology, you just take it as the norm or the normative. Uh, you know, you right? mentioned entrenchment in ideology and I was thinking about the discussion I had before about polarization and dichotomy in the Muslim community when it comes to the popular discussions about, uh, you know, the hot topics, you know, gender, uh, race, critical race theory. And everyone's polarized and how I talked about how it's debates over what constitutes the sacred, what constitutes the deen, what constitutes the immovable center of al-Islam, right? That That's why people are so emotional and so polarized. And I was thinking about what you mentioned and the Salafi Sufi dichotomy. And the perpetuation of this dichotomy owes itself to the exact same phenomena. So why do Suf- why are Sufis so pacifist traditionally, right? When we know historically there are these incredible uh, militant Sufis in the history of Bangladesh, for example, you have Shah Jalal who crossed the Padma on his Jainamas with 300 warriors to vanquish the Hindu king of the north and seek revenge. You have... Uh, the the rebellions of Imam Shamil, right? The spirited rebellion. You had the Ottoman warriors who were who, which was an empire of this, like of of very deeply tasawwuf oriented. This, this is also due to like just the sanitation of history, like the yes, Apple partially, but also okay. it's a dichotomy, bro. You know why? Because there are a lot of people who who uh, have a instinctual disgust response to the to the Salafis, mm. and what's something that the Salafis have actually contributed to the Muslim world? Radical politics. All of the major opposition movements to Western occupation, more or less, in the last fifty to hundred years, with some exceptions, yeah. are Salafi. As in, that's where Salafi. Yes, is. and it's like because of that, a lot of people who uh, incline more towards a, a deeper and more uh, nuanced understanding of Islam, they reject all forms of violence and demonstration perpetuated by Muslims um, as almost this, like lumping it in with Salafism. So it's intrinsic to the Salafi movement, and then the Salafis see the the quote unquote those individuals uh, as sort of soft sellout types. And then you have the perpetuity of this dichotomy and the, and the um, crystallization of the two camps. And that's, that's basically why I believe these ideas are so uh, rigid and simplistic, but immovable. Mm. A Sufi will always f- probably be apolitical and always try to, to move towards quietism and, and away from radical and violent uh, ra- revolution because of their disdain for the Salafi, which then clouds their ability perhaps to form a it's, politics. Yeah, self-fulfilling in a way. Yeah. It's weird. So it's, it's the same, and it's so interesting we mentioned that. Like, it all connects, doesn't it? It all comes down to some very, like, fundamental psychological and, and sociological phenomena. They just repeat themselves. Yeah. Mm. And they're all in the midst of that. It's like the West is just constantly grabbing as much shit as they can off the Muslim shelf and just like bundling <laughs> it into their bag and scurrying away. You know, the way that, that um, when I was in India, there was uh, the tour guide I had was Muslim. And every single room you go into, and he was a really nice guy. He keeps saying like, guys, I mean, no offense in case you get offended, but like the British, like they destroyed everything. Here we can see where, like, they'll be like, here we can see where the British stole, like, all of this treasure. This is like, the sea is yeah. white. And yeah, yeah. Like, and, then, and then he goes, like, and here we can see where the British massacred 50 people. Here we can see where the British plundered. The, here we can see, that? yeah, everything. And he was just like, he was just like, I'm sorry now. Like, I know I keep saying this over and over again, but the British was also did this. Yeah. Oh. 
I'm not doing it though. Yeah. Like, it's it's very, not appropriate. Yeah. yeah. Um, right. But yeah, the the <laughs> get cancelled. Funny, yeah. Funny. The um, bro, he was so like, it was so funny, right? And we just kept saying, no, no, we 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 don't like the British either. It's okay. <laughs> after that, after that, he was so relaxed. He was like, the British took this, and he came and he actually showed us like in detail. He's like, yeah, so these books were actually printed um, with gold, right? Like gold, they were written in gold ink, yeah. And on the walls, the calligraphy was done in gold ink. The British, you can see where the fires that the British, like this is where the British um, put their torches and lit the wall on fire to melt the gold off the wall. And they did this in 1947 as they were leaving. Oh, wow. And That's crazy. what I realized when I was there, it's like, why do people see it purely as a plundering of the physical and the yeah, material crazy. but it wasn't bro it's was pl- like the exact same thing they did with islam yeah, yeah and they did that with our thought mm, mm. that's very deep swallow. that's deep bro yeah no it's and i think a lot of people are unaware of that to what degree and that's why you need like going back to like critical race on these subjects you need that in that in that case right decolonization um it's a really important topic and we should be like involved in that it's orcs for me bro because like uh, what i've had to come to terms with is the fact that you don't just when you convert to islam you don't just magically abandon the baggage that you inherit like the orientalism that you are born and raised with Mm. you don't just magically abandon that i think we have to be self-aware and understand like whilst i can strive to be a pious and practicing muslim a lot of my ideas come from the fact that i see islam and i see the world i see society mm. fundamentally through the lens of the ancestors the descendants of those people who melted the pages not the ones whose pages were melted from mm. yeah and it's it you can't say uh, no one's been able to convince me as of yet that it's not significant sorry back to um theosophical school yeah, well, do you know say. much about them? Yeah, I know a little bit about them. Yeah, what are your thoughts? Because you know how we just, talked yeah, before. It was like a bunch of hippies that discussed pop, like. It's still active, bro. They got even like. I didn't know it was still active. Even in Sydney, they've for um, real. This, yeah, I know. It's that, gotta be all old, old white people, right? I know they were like considered like an intellectual force in the early 1900s of like a melting pot of like different cultures because like. It was the first time the West was actually ever seeing Indian texts and like Islamic and, texts. And then that's why Gandhi got into, I guess, Hinduism through this. Yeah, he school. got into Hinduism through the West. It was weird. For yeah, him. yeah, yeah. Because yeah. he's a colonial subject, like par excellence. Like he, um, he would have had a really good, like, high up, like, position as a British official, like, as in, like, an Indian. But that's the question. Do you know what I mean? So, like, the, Cause the, he studied the, in the point Cambridge is, is like, in India, he wasn't even doing too well with his studies. How did he suddenly get fast tracked? to like the west and you know went through became did, a lawyer how, how did did he go uk first or south africa first? i think no uk first to get his education he got his law and then, and then yeah he and then he went law in, in, south in south africa, africa yeah. yeah so there's that kind of conversation how did it happen like why did it happen who bankrolled his because he didn't have a lot of money as well right oh, um, okay, yeah. I've like, never heard of this. you know it's so interesting but like i'm just thinking about what you're saying and I'm like, I'm just sitting here. I wouldn't be surprised considering how toxic, obviously how bad like, the British I'm are. I'm thinking like, about oh. what you're saying and about how like, um, I'm like, damn, Tans, I'm so cynical. That's my thought, right? Uh, yeah. But I realize like, it's, it's again, our cultural differences lead us to this thing where I'm like sort of, I'm conditioned to think well of Gandhi as a Westerner. Yeah. It's like, what? No, Gandhi's good. Like, that's my gut instinct. It's like, whoosh, I'm whipping out Wikipedia to be like, no, Tans, I'm going to refute Bro, you. This is- but you are almost conditioned to be cynical about political leaders in the Muslim world, right? Yeah. Because such has been the affairs of, of Muslims in, in, in your homelands um, and in the homelands of our like your ancestors that it's natural to presume that there's some kind of an understanding colonialism as you do. Mm-hmm. It's natural to presume that there's some kind of agenda or, or <clears throat> greater politics at play. But I just thought that was a really interesting example of how like we, I, I don't think, mm-hmm. I, I caught myself in that instinctual response, right? So I think um, in terms of political opposition to British colonialism, like it was first articulated by like wealthy Indians, like those who were sons of the landlord class. So Rabindranath 
Iqbal, Gandhi, they were all from like an upper class yeah. in their societies. Like their families owned land so they could afford a British education. So that's why they went there because they were actually the beneficiaries of colonialism because they were in that high standing in Indian society. But they obviously had that moment of understanding like, like no, this is wrong. And like they had that political awakening. Are you so, familiar with Iqbal Ahmed? Iqbal Ahmed? Yeah, I think that's his name. He was is, friends with um, Edward Said. No, nah, I haven't. Oh, okay. really. Anyway, sorry. It's Iqbal like, Ahmed. I know uh, Ijaz Ahmed or something. Oh, I think it's Ijaz Ahmed. Ijaz Ahmed is a post-colonial like, theorist as well. He's um pretty big. But I don't, I don't know what his exact work is. I've heard some lectures by him. But um, but yeah, it's... um, I don't think Gandhi was a Western <laughs> agent. But as in like he um he had his part to play. I think what he did was still great, but it's not the reason why the British left. He um, the back to the, sorry, Theosophical School, where it was really interesting. We were talking about before um, when it comes to, well, I think we were talking about like truth and um, ways to truth. So like, what the Theosophical School is is like, I think it presumes almost a um, you know what do you call it? All religions lead to a certain truth. Like a level of perennialism, but then they base it around like um, Greek works of the Greeks as well. But then they take on, yeah, but then they take on like um, other traditions and try to analyze it. And they all have that kind of fountain of, fountain of truth, so to speak. And so for them, that's how they go about things. And so it's really interesting. Like the main person I thought, I think it was a lady, she used to be like a head, like a, um, like strong atheist, like personality, and then became like, part of the theosophical society and then it's all like very powerful people and stuff and it was really interesting seeing like Gandhi sort of mm. entangled in it as well mm. because it's like there's a lot of political power attached to it mm. and so it's like there I I think there's validity in the sense that politically speaking they wanted power and this was a way to gain power as well through other means in other countries so I something think that to, he certainly saw um the Muslims as an ally against the British, right? like he he was hundred percent at all costs because he supported the Khilafat movement. Yeah, he yeah, hated, that's the other contradiction. He hated all view. like attempts at communalism, like splitting Hindu and Muslim efforts. He was like, no, we're one people, and we should all like strive for one state afterwards. So like he hated like um uh, Muhammad Ali Jinnah and stuff like and like they called so Muslim separatism like as in. That's why a lot of Indians are actually sad about Pakistan. They're like, we should have been one people. As not the Hindutva right-wing fanatics. They like, love it. Th- what do you mean? They're grateful for Pakistan, man. The yeah, yeah, Hindutva yeah. Fanatics. That's what the, like the, the yeah. pro- progressive, like middle-class Indian view is like, oh, it's so sad. We should have been one nation. Whereas Pakistan is like, um, nah, this was an independence. We we're going to be oppressed by the Hindus. It's very different, like the whole perspective of it all. Where do you stand on it as someone who studied it? Like, uh, it probably, probably like India should have been one nation with a confederation of states, sort of like the US, as in that's the direction that it could have went towards. Yeah, or like the Russian but federation. because of like, I don't know, because of like hearsay and rumors and like that sort of like rising tension, like people sort of took those sides like, nah, we're Muslim, we're Hindu. It was sort of like, it was, it was very artificial in a way, but that's because those lines were drawn early on and like the british encouraged that of course like for people to identify religiously because no people never identified as hindu like apparently it was very yeah that. apparently it was very confusing the first census that the british conducted in india around the turn of the century mm. um and the uh, people were identifying as hindu and muhammadan yeah, yeah, in like yeah, yeah. this is like they 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 took pr- uh, surveys of provinces where there were like 100,000 people mm. and 80,000 people identified as hindu and 60,000 people identified as muhammadan and they're like there's 140,000 answers. And but they realize that, that like people... We, it's that Hinduism is a construct of the British, right? Before it wasn't viewed as such, right? Because there's different strands of Hinduism. And so they're all obviously conflicted with itself, not just like Muslims and Hin- versus Hindus. It might owe to a little bit some trends before that, like the Bhakti movement, which tried to sort of, um, in my very cursory understanding, unite uh, certain disparate Hindu peoples in the like uh, Deccan Plateau under a sort of ref- it was a banner of like reformist so reformed hinduism um that began yeah towards the decline of the mughal empire but then it was clearly something that the british had a lot of trouble with like they just really didn't get it did they yeah but then you see like the mughal 
leaders as well, many scholars of that era would think that this ruler is being infected by Hindu ideas or mm. you know philosophical Hindu philosophical thought. Uh, was um Dina Ilahi. Oh, yeah. <laughs> was, that Al- was that Akbar? That was Akbar, Akbar. and uh, some say Jahangir as well, but it's probable that Jahangir didn't adopt Dina Ilahi properly. It was uh, Aurangzeb's brother. Darshiko. Who, Dar- Darshiko. He Darshiko. was seen in that light as well, and that's why I think that he. To be honest, though, I think that Darshiko was portrayed like that. Yeah, I agree. Because, I because that, of Aurangzeb, like trying to because uh, of his religious crusade. Yeah, he wanted to take the play the religious card to like get more legitimacy. Because um, like he would get the throne right? exactly. Like, there's so political it's like, pressures involved. Yeah. Too. Whereas Darashuku, I, I think he, he was like a poet, like a the yeah. Typical, he was just like you know he had a earring, he was going with his beard and like deep. Yeah, I see. Even temperaments. Like, <laughs> see, like when I read those accounts, I think the same way in the sense that I know, like I guess if you take the like you can look at it's like you have the Islamic perspective. And you see these texts have truth in them in the sense that they may have been revealed at a certain time. So like I guess these like leaders are seen as in that light like oh look they're inf-. like i think it's sorry to the <laughs> the salafi sort of approach in the sense that oh a bit of this you know is infected islam and are you truly islam because i don't know these philosophical ideas you're i don't know too much philosophy or whatever i feel like that kind of perspective or mentality can that's disgusting s- man like you know anwar shah kashmiri is one of the greatest scholars uh, of the modern era he's a like post uh, Wali Allah, post Shah Wali Allah, subcontinental scholar, and as you can tell from his his name, he was from Kashmir. He memorized the entire lab- library of Al Azhar. This guy was a freak, like one of those one in a million like photographic memory savants, um, and also a very intellectual man. And there was one of his students said about him like, if Islam must be true, and his his realization and certainty, yakin in the Deen of Islam was was uh, solidified by the fact that. He he concluded if there was a fault, an intellect, uh, uh, logical, or um, contradiction, a logical fault or like a contradiction, a logical fallacy or contradiction within Islam, um, Anwar Shah Kashmiri would have figured it out. Wow. But it wasn't possible because he didn't like leave any stone unturned. This guy memorized the entire library. You know how big the library of Al Azhar is. He was a machine. He could just like flick through pages, memorize them. But there were three books he couldn't memorize. Al Quran. Um, yeah, he couldn't memorize the Quran because every time he tried to, the, like he would just be like spun out by the profundity of each ayah, and he would ponder it for so long that he couldn't proceed to memorize the entire thing. The other two, you know what? The other two, the Mathnavi of Rumi and the Bostan of Saadi Shirazi, like Saadi Shirazi. Yeah, those were the three books that Anwar Shah Kashmiri couldn't memorize, or maybe it was the Gulistan. Sorry, not not the Bostan. He couldn't memorize them. The profundity of them was 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 so like engrossing for him that he was unable to just sit there and commit them to memory. Because like every time he read a line, he'd just be like dazzled. And so the Quran, obviously, in its primacy, is the the revelation. But after that, to this great scholar, the two most uh, the two most compelling articulations of the deen of Islam, of philosophy, of life, were the poetry of Saadi and the poetry of Rumi. Imagine trying to explain that to people now. Imagine trying to go and be like, yeah, we'll read from the Quran, we'll do some tafsir al Quran in the masjid, and then we'll do some uh, Rumi and Saadi. What would people do? There'd be a rebellion. <laughs> you'd be, you'd be pitchforked somewhere, right? But, on the other hand, obviously, we talk a lot about how um, these poems, these poetry, these poets, sorry, are sanitized by Westerners. And you had the episode with Sharzade about that, right? And Zirar about the sanitize the sanitization of Muslim poetry and the de Islamization, like the de Islamizing of these poets. But sometimes we uh, talk about that without really trying to reclaim mm. them for ourselves and and fit them within our indigenous canon. The, um, Abdul Hakim Murad had a recent like C- CMC talk in the CMC garden <laughs> um, about the 
Yeah, Muslims are at a loss because in this like oh, the devoid one. of meaning Western secular world, we haven't brought over that really romantic, passionate, luxuriant literature that our peoples had. I listen to that. And the thing is, like, as in that, it's such a cornerstone of our societies back home. Like, everyone knows poetry. Everyone knows like the greats in Bangladesh. It's like um, what do you call it? It's um, Nazrul Islam. It's Lalon, it's Robin Trunat, like everyone, everyone knows these references and the popular songs and how heartfelt and deep it is. Whereas like our generation here, we don't know anything about poetry. We're just so devoid of that because firstly, it's a loss of language. Secondly, therefore loss of poetry. And so like we, um, like our equivalent is like um, crank that soldier boy. Like, I, I don't know, like what do we like, like remember wistfully from our youth? Like, do you, do you get what I mean? Like we have, we don't have that basis of like, that wellspring of emotion and um, feeling that, like, forms like I don't know the inner the inner inner dimensions in soul of a society. So he was talking about that and how that's why Saadi Rumi was so like that they were so big back in the day in um in Arab Persian society. Uh, Mehmet Fatih Sultan Mehmet uh, requ- uh, famously when he entered the Hagia Sophia for the first time after his conquest recited words from Saadi exactly yeah. yeah yeah and then um you know um Muhammad Asad road, road to Mecca he's got this page where he's like in the middle of the desert and he's like talking to a Bedouin and the Bedouin just quotes this one verse from like um Saadi or something like he had he, he like witnesses a moment he, like he witnesses something he's like oh this reminds me of this verse how fitting is this verse he's like he's like then it struck me, like, imagine a Western peasant in the Germanic, mm. a Prussia, whatever it was then, <laughs> um, quoting a verse of Goethe or William Blake or, like, an uh, Englishman quoting William Blake or, De- or Percy, um, Percy Shelley, whatever. Like, it's, it's unfathomable. They don't have that connection to um, literature like the Muslim world had it. So, yeah, yeah. I think that's a, pres- a massive point as in about, like, being big on poetry and re-encountering that part of our and people will say things like poetry is not for me and it's like it's probably because you don't want it you don't want to understand it but you kind of i, I think it's um our instrumentalist society is like people like yeah bro i read books i read 100 books a year and all the books are like self-help um, self-help how to have a more productive day to maximize your side hustle <laughs> as in if you look at everything like self-help mental clarity so that you have enough time to ride, run your side hustle <laughs> to like just make more money it's about capital at the end of the day as that's what you realize about the society there's like any activity that detracts from capital it's like like it's not a part of the equation any any activity like there's gym there's like all these books literature but like as in there's no actual literature it's all like it. fake empty stuff about how to maximize your productivity and have mental peace to make more. I think that the re- the importance of literature for me is in uh, islamic literature for me as a like obviously there's the argument that um, it's not necessarily re- like a Persian poet is not necessarily relevant to an Australian convert, right? Uh, but the thing is, these are articulations of Quranic realities. Exactly, 100, 100. and that's why it's important. We need to. People say, "Oh well, you know, you have Quran and Sunnah, even like the the Uga Buga Quran Sunnah. Why need poetry? Like caveman, um, caveman uh, talk, right? That very simple, very. Uh, I I, th- I think a large part of that what. Tanzim mentioned in that beginning that unpacking and that cultural relatability of the Quran and text happened definitely the, exactly. poetry. We through, need to gain through poetry understand. in exactly. pre modern society. People knew poetry, and that's how like Dean was real for them. Nowadays, Dean's not real for anyone because it's just fake. Adith they're texts all exegetes. They they're to. all exegetes yeah. uh, who who bring the Quranic and uh, prophetic values. They're the same. They're one and the same. I don't have to separate them. The the the, the, the prophetic and Quranic values and the deen into real life situations and evocations in literature but 100 percent, we need our own in this context i don't know what that form that would take bro i think we talk about this almost every episode like i talk about the anwar shah kashmiri quote every episode but um it just seems it's such a it's such a important quote for me yeah, yeah, yeah. but it, like what are the potential avenues for That's a good point. muslim expression literature? i don't think rami is a bad job to be honest i don't think it's like I don't think it's a bad attempt. TV show. Yeah. <laughs> like with your cousin and all that. <laughs> <laughs> bro, bro, how yeah. uh, that, that's that's as Muslim as it gets. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's it. his Islamic 
<laughs> I guess those are the eternal truths. I guess we can all reflect on. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's like I'm trying to think. Like, <laughs> no, the 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 way that he explores his in a deeper and, and a more it's like metaphysical way. Like no, nah, it's deeper than that. He, he tries, you know, he joins the tariqa oh, and he no, tries yeah, to, yeah, yeah that's true, that's true. he tries to work on his spiritual. But he keeps like it's like the cycle of uh, toba and then constant like yeah. heedlessness and toba yeah, yeah, yeah. and heedlessness. Actually, that's it's pretty good in that depiction of like. And he's but like the he he explores the idea of spirituality as like he deconstructs the idea of spirituality necessarily as being this linear progression. Rather, ah, it's kind okay. of like a uh, for him, it's like his experience of it is something cyclical. Where it's like, you know, you, you reach, you think that someone's reaching a zenith, a spiritual zenith, and you're, you're excited and relieved. And then they just come cascading back to worse than when they were before and disappoint everyone around them. And then you've got to sort of start again. And I thought that's what it explored. That was amazing, man. That was a journey. Not for everyone, obviously. A lot of, um, a lot of, uh, shadowy issues with, with watching this, such a program. <laughs> program. Just skip the haram scenes, guys. But, Take it seriously. Come with an open mind. Mm. And then other than that, bro, I don't know. Like, what else is there? Rap music? Like Muslim no, rappers? I wouldn't say rap music. Rap music's like... Muslim rappers and things like that? Do you think that that's like a potential album? Nah, Muslim rappers. There's not really anyone that like... As in, there's rappers that will like remind you of what's important in life and like many stuff. Khalid Siddiq's really good. I oh, yeah, yeah. I guess he's like probably an exception, but like in terms of get like... I my from widespread. Saudi. yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's like that, like that, that, one, that one song still on Dean is like that does the job that's like amazing <laughs> I listen to that so many times it's the fastest talk about refuting the Salafis bro yeah one song at a time so we've got rap music and we've got a show about a guy who um who has a intermingling with his cousin has a <laughs> has a situation with his cousin that's what we're dealing with now what no, like I'm thinking about it right and it, it's important to me I guess it goes back to the point I made before about relevant. You know how I made the joke about in the masjid where people were like, ha ha, this is hilarious. Like, I don't want to go. And the guy's wife was like, come on, can we leave now? I can't listen to this khutbah anymore. So the guy's like, nah, why do you want to leave? I want to hear where he goes from here, you know? Um, we need these articulations, bro. Mm. I, think, I think it's like, <laughs> you know, like... um. Every podcast after two hours, it comes back to, yeah, so we really need to have these conversations. Like, I can't believe these <laughs> have conversations you seen the, like, TikToks are not about being podcasts? had. Like, that's what it feels like we've come back to. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, people need to be doing this, you know? They have to get out yeah. there. You know, you'd have to really engage with the community. community. <laughs> <laughs> just like, no, I, I say it, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Like, just like the, the word most, community comes up the every, most every, like, cliche stuff. Like, you know, we have a lot of issues in the community. Like you and I think that we really have to be working with the community, with the community. in order to like, address these issues. That's the in, problem. In like, the community. community is not being heard. But you know Especially what? women. Josh, it's all about <laughs> conversation. I think it starts with conversation. Bro, thank you. Kill me. I saw that. I think it starts with conversation and, and self-awareness. Um, I recently went to a, um, a wellness and mindfulness retreat. And they just like, they really made me think about myself and my place in the world. But yeah, men's rights, huh? <laughs> so how about that? How about feminism? <laughs> the no, 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 I think, but like, cultural production doesn't occur in the same way that it did in the pre-modern world. No. It's like, how do you make masses of young people relate to one thing? Do you get what I mean? As in, like, do you think that Islam as in have a shared platform for meaning? Uh, to 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 take it away from the community. Do you think that Islam will always be anachronistic to young Muslims? No, I don't think so. Do you um, think it is? In Australia, maybe. Uh, nah, I actually don't know. Because um, I was listening to a podcast by Umar Ali and Ubat Allah uh, Evans. Ali, um, bro, I just discovered that guy. He's so the coolest. They were talking about like how black Muslims became Muslim on mass in the 60s and 70s because there was a powerful cultural movement malcolm x um muhammad ali there were these cultural figures and then there was a black panther movement as well it meant something greater than just identity it was like a matter of like i'm going to change the world i'm going to like um to fight u.s imperialism i guess that's one aspect with muhammad ali i'm going to fight racism as in this is what he said is that, um 
being Islam felt like being a more authentic black person. Do you get what I mean? As in Islam was being more black. So it's like I'm being myself in the best way by becoming Muslim. How do you do that for like Aussies, right? It just feels like what is that shared meaning? Do you get what I mean? As in that's how like that cultural change started in the US with figures like that. And then we need some like uh, someone to come along and sing Islamic Slim Dusty songs. Banjo Banjo Slim Patterson. <laughs> I haven't heard of that. Since. Sheikh Banjo Patterson. <laughs> <laughs> heard of that since year four. The, the, like waltzing Matilda, but with like Nishid. Australian culture. I guess there's the indigenous Aboriginal culture is like um, there's a bit of, but like in terms of crossover into Muslim and Islam, it's it's Muslims and Islam is a bit different. It's a bit more difficult. But yeah. That's you I've need been, one though because like your so family aren't going to be able to um, preserve it for many more generations. Like your indigenous culture will give you some sort of refuge mm. for generations, but like after three generations, four generations born in the country, yeah, yeah, one hundred, it's going to go away. Like, like, like countless Muslims in the US who are like 40, 50 now. You ask them like, um, "Oh, how'd you become practicing? Or how'd you become Muslim?" And they all have a story about in the 90s, they heard a rap song and it made them curious. As in that's like every American Muslim man nowadays. As in 80% of them, by and large. If they're born in the US, then that's their pathway to Islam. If they came from overseas, then they're just an immigrant. But um, How as in, funny in terms was of the, the next Dr. generation. Lee, the Umar Lee story where it's like, did you get your green card? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's the difference between the previous generation and like our generation in terms of like, building islam is something here it's yeah i guess it requires a lot of effort to think of that Australia's just a cultural. weird place bro yeah, yeah like what is it yeah yeah what yeah. are we doing here yeah it's like a penal colony there's no tradition like that it's that's just i mean in a way that makes it not as bad because like we can actually argue that like i'm an equal like all of us can argue nah i'm an equal claimant to this identity yeah, because yeah, there you go, there you because go. there's no like there's no monopoly from like anglo celtic nationalists they can't just claim it like necessarily, yeah. right? So in America, there's been like Islam has been made been made mainstream through black culture and hip hop culture. In the UK, there's a forced insularity because they're always the outsider. That's it. Do you get what I mean? That's so that's it. why the UK exactly. community in many ways is very different. Australia's like a confederation. Australia's like it's it's so new mm. and the Muslim generation is so new, it hasn't had that cultural efflorescence to see which way it goes like do you stay like a hermit or do you actually engage with wider society so those are like open questions about we won't know for another two generations like these ghettoization because because yeah because um in the u.s they have their kids kids as in it's like third fourth generation now so they have like a proper experience and black people being there and already being muslim is like the biggest difference right there's already that relatability like no uh islam is american because we've got black people exactly. that like maintained it and still have it it's sort of the same case there, whereas in Europe, bro, like in Italy as well, it's incredibly complex because you're fighting against, like you come into the country and you will always not be Italian, yeah, like yeah, the exactly. foundation of what it means but Europe to be Italian. is so different. Europe, That's like, it. I've got to read up the Abdul Hakim Murad, his new book on it, because um, he, he provides some inroads on He's, how. bro, he's like mind-bending. I was going to say something worse. mind in the <laughs> European intellectuals, though, by saying like Islam actually makes me capable of being more European than you. Yeah, you know, like that's see, his that's his attitude. Europe has always been totally opposed to Islam, so I don't like as in I've got to read his book. Like um, a lot of Europeanness is actually ex as a, as an idea is just in response to Islam. It's proper opposition to Islam. Like that's that's what it is. Like the the one doesn't exist without the other. Like so, you, yeah, UK and Europe, European consciousness, like opposition. under the under the Habsburgs, um. That the the birth of European identity was under like the uni uniting of Christendom against Muslim um, incursion. Yeah, literally, literally. And, um, so that's but that's it. Like, how do you? It's so hard, bro, to find like a, it's really hard. Like in the community, it's really hard to find a way. Like again, we're going back into like podcast cliches two hundred one. It's hard to, but it is hard to find a place amongst it all. I, I honestly don't. If anyone's got a solution, I, I think we we'll try. But yeah, what's it called? Traveling home. On, uh, traveling. Traveling home essays on Europe and Islam or something. Mm. I've got to actually read it and see what he says, because yeah, it's a big, it's a big piece. The whole cultural um, inroads relatability piece, because I think America have it by and large. Like they have like a system whereby you can feel Muslim but feel American. 
Do you get what I mean? Yeah, but I still they feel do. Like, like everyone looks at America here and it's like, bro, what's going on over there? But that's because they're seeing the San Francisco, like the crazies, like the left. Uh, the, as in, do you get what I mean? Yeah. That's not actually like the experience of the average. That's just what we see in the news. That's true, man. Like I mean, I'm listening to Mad Mom. Just like, oh, that. America's falling apart. Like you know, they don't. The, the, the TMM guys like, just don't seem to have that same angst, do they? That they do. No, they don't. Of, as in like in TMM terms of being don't in, have that same angst about their own identity like that existential like ah uh, they got an angst angst existential angst oh, instead yeah, of, of finding the left exactly yeah, but I in, mean yeah, I yeah. mean about like in terms of their identity like it's it's not something that they have issues with like oh am I Muslim am I American what does it mean am I you know yeah they've yeah, so come to a stable that's it it's like sort of more yeah I, I noticed that I, I get more that like sense. the left's gonna destroy us as in they like it's that like eternal culture war now that they're embroiled in that's like a very in, inter, in, internal to America sort of culture thing wars, man. culture wars just the but um yeah it's interesting it's open questions for Australian Muslims because uh, Australian Muslims I feel like it's so uh, like Lebanese Arab dominated in a way so it's like when you see a like the Muslim in the news it's always like the mm. Lebanese community, the like a hijabi Muslim, yeah. on SBS that's like it's from like, the Arab uh, Let me tell you, as, a, as, so, a, so, as a former like yeah. white kafir, let like, me tell well, you that we, you saw it. Yeah. we do not, we do not <laughs> think of put desis in the same category <laughs> as Zing. Like it doesn't matter how Muslim you are. <laughs> it's like, like, no, but you're different. You're not Muslim. Yeah. Like you're my like mom, successful. me, like it's just instinctive like for us to just like be like, here's Muslims and here's subcontinent people. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it they, doesn't they, matter if you're like, if you're... um. Yeah, if you're like a middle class Indian Muslim, like yeah. we just would, you'd, you'd never be seen by my family the same as Arab. 100% you it's would never. It's a racial connotation. It's 100% it is, bro. Like it's completely. It's like um, a separate community almost. It is. Yeah. It is yeah. Same with Africans. They're just seen differently. Um, African Muslims are seen differently by white people. Yeah. It's yeah. all Arabs. Indonesians are seen completely differently. It, like I don't even know if most white people know Indonesians are Muslim. I, have, I barely know like whether they would actually realize that. Because I think a lot of them just go to Bali and they, it's like Bali is not Muslim. It's like the yeah, one island in Indonesia it's where it's not Muslim. So they're like, they just think that Indonesians are not Muslim. So they just count them as like other Southeast Asian peoples. Yeah. You know, uh, you know Massimo Luongo? Yeah, of course. Yeah. The you legend. know, apparently Who's this? Uh, he's a soccer player the for Australia. Oh, okay. Apparently he's half Indonesian. Italian. Half Indonesian. Yeah, half Italian. And he has a great grand mother that was a great grandfather was a king of the in the i think it's indonesia like a muslim oh, ruler this is sick bro. yeah let me let me pull it up actually you know nick, nick curios's mom is malaysian i'm pretty sure and his yeah. sister's name is halima his sister looks like hella indonesian yeah. as in, not that i've been on her instagram What's or anything massimo luongo wait i'm searching it up now i don't know i was just like reading it the other day i don't know why actually no i don't know why yeah so uh, he's of he has half Indonesian heritage, half Italian heritage, and according to Longo himself, his maternal great grandfather was Sultan Ambela Abu Al Khair Sirajuddin of Bima Sultanate, based in Sumbawa. Whoa, that's crazy, right? I don't know if he's Muslim though. That's some clout, right? There. Yeah, that's mad clout, man. That's mashallah. Should get him on the podcast. Talk about that. Yeah. Eh? <laughs> There's um, my favorite is you know Mustafa Amini. Have you ever heard of yeah, him? Yeah, yeah. He, uh, he's my like fr- my friend in high school dude. the most like racially ambiguous dude you'll ever see in oh, your life right man? yeah he's like a ginger a, a freckled ginger with an afro um he's half his full name is muhammad mustafa castillo amini right that's already like what's going on there yeah he played for dortmund afghan father and a nicaraguan mother <laughs> wow <laughs> that is the coolest mix i've ever seen in my life i think we're done i think we've we've uh I wanted to ask, uh, I'm not going to ask now, but I wanted to ask because it was 100 episodes mm. and um, because I wanted to do a 100th episode kind of asking questions about our journey to yeah. now. I'll ask one question from my list of bunch of questions I had that I thought I'd ask today, but didn't ask a single one. As always, that's what happens with episode planning. What's been the most impactful episode you've done you first. Sure. you first. You've done like oh, this. this like Mohamed Isak um, thing that sparked me to learn about the temperaments that really changed. Mm. I think that's probably the most impactful in my life. Yeah, for sure. Um, in terms of other stuff like 
Um, Taba has to be up there. Um, yeah, uh, Ishaq stands out. Yeah, Taba, Yasir, kind of them. But which one stand out for you? Samir Mahmoud. Yeah. The one where I told you about. It's a funny story, bro. Like, I woke up. I was half asleep, staggered out into my bit my lounge room. Samir Mahmoud was there. I had some manush. And then we started the discussion. And it was like, I was half asleep, bro. But then, like, straight away I was awake. Because the conversation just was so deep, so quick. And I felt my mind, like, my mind actually working. Like, the synapses firing. And, and I think that the feeling that I had, the overall feeling I, that I had, in a time where normally it's like the most spiritually arid time of the day for me like 7 8 a.m in the morning it's like okay like there's not gonna be a lot of i never have any profound realizations or conversations at 7 a.m in the morning but for it to have been so deep and challenging and i mean challenging in a intellectual sense not like like difficult i mean like challenging me and getting really profound answers to the questions that we had and the way that it flowed that was bro. That was an experience, um, but yes, the first Taba episode, incredible. Um, the first Yasir Morsi episode you did about the dynamics of power was called the dynamics of power and oppression. Yeah, and the audio was uh, not the greatest. <laughs> At times, you know, you get into the when you're talking, but I persevered, and cause like I came out of it, and my mind was like blown. I was thinking about it for like two days afterwards, you know. So those those three speakers for me are are like <coughs> very yeah incredibly significant. I really bro, you know, I have fond memories of what? Um, Omar <laughs> Baloch. I just have the first really, one we did was really good. I just have really fond memories of my discussion with him, bro. Like he, he was just like a, I don't know. It's like that. That, that was like peak BITC days for me, man. Asking yeah, things, I had a lot of fun and. Um, Another one that I listened to that was incredible was uh, what's his name? The gentleman from the UK, I think. Hizr Ali Mir. Yeah, his one was. That good. was lit. Um, and the other British gentleman. Forget his name. Sheikh. Oh, uh, Asim Yusuf. Asim Yusuf. That Dr. was a Asim really Yusuf. good episode. That's it. That, that was like proper, like. it. That episode summed up to me that I guess the activists or the. Uh, I guess people. Because I don't think he adheres to the traditions, traditions that we talk about. We kind of maybe caricature, right? He, yeah. He's very like open to different ideas and the way looking at the tradition, it's not what you see him. It's a lot more mm-hmm. like he unpacks the historical angle, right? And that was really fascinating. That was like, okay, this actually um, does away with a lot of even like that very traditional, traditional mindset where it's like, wait, you're not even like traditional because Dr. Asim Yusuf really unpacks the historical analysis in terms of what led up to you know certain instances in how you know looking at fic and all that so like that was really can cool. i ask you one question too yeah do you regret not having mufti abu Leith on at some point bro i think about that like i was thinking about that the whole last week ah, I knew it. i'm not gonna lie and i'm i'm always this tussle between Having him on and getting cancelled. No, but with that, and can you, I lose my think, mind? Do you think that would be the worst cancellation you could experience? Nah, I actually genuinely do want to have a conversation. Okay, so I don't know. We're talking about the po- oh, podcast, I might as well say, like, here and there, I sometimes tune in because he sometimes does lives and yeah, stuff. Yeah, and I listen to his lives too. He was talking about something really interesting. He was like, I wouldn't agree exactly with his statement. Like, for example, I think he said, like, the hudud shouldn't be legislated or something to have. I don't want to. Um, say that was his thing i think that was that was what you're saying but basically the, the the sort of tangent he went from that was something i actually did agree with with him when it was to like when it comes to viewing islam he was talking about how in that arab society arab culture the way islam was portrayed was that they only um rasulullah some used language and things of its time to display or represent islam right so it's nested in arab culture 
in that sense. And so you live in a different culture, a different society. It's not going to play out exactly 100% every single rule regulation that follows accordingly from the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu because different time, different circumstance, different people understand things differently. So I guess he was talking about like how fiqh like kind of changes according to that time and place. So that kind of conversation, which he's right. I don't even disagree. He and just he can't drop that and walk away. away. And I'm like, I agree with him the way he kind yeah, of... Yeah, yeah. But he can't drop that and walk away. That's the thing. Like in so much as that's such a complex discussion about the boundaries of fiqh, usul al fiqh, uh, harmonizing text and context. Like you can't just say something like that, undermine it and then be like, I don't know, which is what he does too much. Uh, I don't think he... He does, bro. I don't know. Because he, 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 did he mention the categories, sorry, the categories of um, things which are seen as cultural but are dubious in terms of their necessity what as I did, part of the deal? Uh, what I did agree with him is, for example, I have to fact check this um, specifically about hadith where um, like a man came up to him and said, oh, can I um, kiss while I'm fasting or something? And he's like, no, you can't. But then to another older man he said yes you can and then the people saw that it's like why are you giving different rulings about the same thing to different people and explained and broke it down like you know for the younger person urges desires etc and for the older person it's not like that right so basically um hadith that we have sometimes we legislate everything according to that one hadith yeah but of there's course. you know obviously a more wide range wide scope that's not how uh, usul al-fiqh works though you're right like um, there are a lot of issues of like quote unquote contradictions some of them are unsolved yeah and that's why you have ikhtilaf within madahib right because there are some of these contradictions where you can't actually derive a clear principle so for example the issue of awra so there's a hadith obviously the awra of the man is the navel to the knees everyone knows that right that's the most established opinion obviously besides the idea of whether it means um the top of the knee, does the knee count as awra? Does it mean like what is between the navel and the knees as in the, what's the main thing there? Like, or what does it actually mean? So there's those debates. But beyond that, there's a, another hadith where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was sitting and uh, Abu Bakr and Omar came in to visit him and you could see his uh, thigh. Um, and then after them, he didn't adjust his thaw, like to come down. After when Uthman entered, then he adjusted it. But it's like he still was willing to expose his thigh to um, to people. Where it's like if it was innately part of your private parts, you would never expose it to anyone, right? Is that because of the hadith where angels are shy of Uthman? Yes. The uh, why would I be immodest in front of a man whom even the angels yeah. are modest before? Yes, that's that's the hadith. But it it leads to like a question of like what do you do with the question of awra then? And uh, there's debates like the Ahnaf are pretty strict. The Hanafis are the strictest about it. The Malikis tried to harmonize the two hadith, but they it, it's complex to derive principles based on different examples, um, in in li like hadith literature. And so, when you have rulings, uh, you have to consider that the most important thing is the principle and some. Hadith and every every muhaddith and every alim knows this. I think it's mostly an issue that common people have. And so, like again, it comes down to the salafization of everything because you can't get your deen from a sahih hadith. You don't know anything about that hadith. You just know the Prophet said that, but you can say anything. The Prophet you can like cut words, cut sentences, choose sentences specifically to manipulate it to say, oh, well, this is the words of the Holy Prophet. Or even the fact that our interpretation of what Rasulullah SAW said so like this you can't just see a hadith and objectively understand it's like we're interpreting that statement according to our faculties and yeah and you have to be and, in order to interpret like the fuqaha and the great hadith scholars and fiqh scholars I mean not the hadith scholars necessarily but the, the fuqaha especially they were masters of not just the hadith but language as well yeah. And uh, Imam Malik, a lot of the opinions of the Malikis come down to ikhtilaf about language. So one of the best examples of that is the uh, fasting the six days from Shawal. So which, you know, the, the Malikis say that you're not meant to fast six days from Shawal. It could be any day of the year. Right? It's just six days from Shawal. As it, because Imam Malik interpreted the min in that sentence, min as in from, 
as in being like anyone who fasts six days from Shawwal, meaning anyone who fasts six days from Shawwal onwards, mm-hmm. it's as if he fasted the whole year. Whereas the other one said, no, it's from those 10 days, right? And that's like a, that's a purely like linguistic difference, right? Mm-hmm. One was like, no, that's this is what he's suggesting. Haba, yeah. Right? Like, so that's why, know? that's why you need fiqh. And I think that again, like it comes down to the, um, the incursion of Salafism, but also like the success of the Salafi ideas of uh, the primitive Salafi ideas and the, and the obstruction they run to like these nuances isn't purely the fault of the Salafis. I think a lot of it has to do with the Westernization of Muslims. Uh, psychologically because it it's rather empowering right to think that first of all you can do your own ijtihad um it's a lot of people sort of fancy being contrarian a lot of people seek refuge in the black and white do you get what i mean Mm. yeah so it's understandable to me how salafis have triumphed um and these ideas have triumphed and i don't think we can just blame the individuals who adopt them it's more complex than that as well. I think that that's an issue I have. Like people bash Salafis. And yeah, themselves. so going back to sorry, Mufti Abu Layth, I definitely want to have a hangout or <laughs> in person too. Yeah, um, but having on the show, I don't know. Um, I would want to, if you're talking about from a purely mm. nafs <laughs> desires perspective. For sure, but I think the consequences are going to be too much. Do you think uh, the cancellation you would receive for having Muftul Abu Layton would, tran- would trump any like low-key nah, cancels you've had in the past? But I, I just don't want to go down. It's just mentally too scarring, to be honest. You've That's literally the only reason. By like both everyone. culture war, yeah, activists, uh, haven't you? Yeah, everyone. You've been cancelled for Abdul Al-Andalusi. You've been cancelled for... Um, this is it. Taba. Taba, Nabil Aziz. Yeah, that was boycotting, really. Though that happened there. Um, yeah. Uh, do you think? Hard. Do you think, in in reflection, guys, that we made a mistake with the Nabil Aziz episode? Oh, that's a good reflection. I so that one. I was. I actually didn't know fully his views when we had him on. To be honest, he had a name for himself. He was doing the rounds, and I don't want to put blame on another person. And obviously, there's accountability from my end as well. I'm not disregarding that, but it sounds like. A friend of ours was like, you know, we should get him on this and that. I'm like, okay, fine. And I think um, one of the issues I know that, not issues, I don't say it's an issue, but we definitely have a more laid back character. So we're not like confrontational. Like um, we let the guests speak their mind. And well, was I in that episode or just <laughs> yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was all of us, bro. Yeah, Josh is just trying to distance what, what from the to- podcast. What are we talking about? I totally, f- everything's going yeah. on. I remember it very vividly, but. Again, like I feel, yeah. I feel like um, personally, two things. First of all, if our podcast was, and at the time I believed this, and I actually accept the criticism of like uh, Saha mm. Unko, for example, mm. when she called us liberals, um, I'm like, okay, yeah, I, I was a liberal, you know, to be fair. I did believe that we, everyone should have a platform, all of that garbage, which is not actually right. But at the same time, there's that aspect of it where in my mind, I was just like asking a guy for his views. And then the and the other aspect was that basically it's very difficult when someone's overseas tans him, don't you think? And um, doing it through Zoom to find a way to have a natural flowing back and forth. Yeah. I, I find it really jarring. I need to like sort of read and vibe with the body language of the person to like kind of get an an impression on how I can do things. And I'm a lot more sort of comfortable and emboldened when I'm in person. I don't I find it hard to just sort of say like to a guy who's talking mid like mid flow like I'll cut you off there what about this yeah. cut you and off there what about this a lot of podcasts they don't mind like cutting people off halfway and stuff I think um, one thing I am mind I've been mindful ever since that is that we get the guests and obviously do the research properly and thoroughly but also being mindful that because we're not like going to cut them off or we're not we're just going to let their ideas like kind of um, flow uh, it's just being mindful in terms of who the guest is and doing the discussion accordingly so but in terms of the actual cancellation, where it was it was insane, man. It was that actually, was the worst, yeah. And we weren't even that like, I think maybe a popularity went up a little bit after that. But we weren't even that known, bro. Like I'm about now, like what people we're listen people to listen. podcast. Back then wasn't we weren't even near as popular as we are now, right? It was really interesting. So like, but actually properly like 
people were well, on Twitter, it started like doing the rounds, right? I had people like reach out to me, people I didn't expect to reach out. People wanted to turn the um, guests that came on, wanted to Which take boycott, down the episode. Yeah, they were boycotting it. <laughs> um, on Facebook, it was like blowing up. And then TM did that episode. And then it's getting all these, bro, it was so overwhelming. I was on holiday that time, bro. That was like the worst holiday. Did Because I was just like flagging out. Did Bill bro. blast us on TMM? Or something. He didn't blast no, he, us. He was kind of more f- sympathetic to us, really. No, but then he made a claim, bro. I was trying to find it. He said, "Oh, this podcast isn't gonna last more than a year and a half." But it's been way past. Yeah, a year. but again, like I, so I, I was, was trying to find that from, comment. His tone was more like, "Oh, yeah. these kids, you know, they've just caved into the pressure of like these crazy activists." Like that was. Yeah, his I said, that's tag, fair like, enough. We did it. <laughs> 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 no, no, I was protecting it down from the moment like we got. Uh, backlash because some of the stuff he's tweeted is like insane. He's like, yeah, see, yeah the even, Europeans are superior. The Prophet said so in the Hadith. It's see, like the uh, Romans we didn't are, know to crazy. that extent yeah. um, before. Um, but yeah, that's. Do you think the content of the episode was? I forgot the content. Horrendous. Like it was it blanked my mind. What are you talking about? I remember. Um, he called. Uh, he said, "What did he say? Men are pussy whipped." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember we laughed at that. But wh- what was he talking about? Like men aren't men anymore. Yeah, men are not men. It's a whole like um, the usual. Sort yeah, of but it was something about uh, shakes have to get testosterone. Yeah, he talked about how like that. testosterone is in- integral. Like, what the heck? We what? shouldn't. I thought that was a bit random and like a little bit like conspiracy theory-ish But um, we probably should have. We probably should have. In fairness. Uh, push back a little bit on that. <laughs> Just a little bit. What, what, All right, Josh, sorry. Uh, what were his qualifications? Why did we have him on? Because he was he, big on he, Twitter. He then. has clout. Yeah, yeah, he has cool. clout. And TMM, TMM had already had him on. It was on. part of Red Pill kind of culture. Oh, right, so. right, right, right. Because I can't think of any reason why he should be given any voice, like looking retrospectively, but... As in, he was just vo- to be for fair, that. like in reflection, I don't think we've been that discerning with the guests we've had on a lot of the time. True, true. true. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. we just sort of like ah, they're famous. But <laughs> this, this bloke has nothing to say. Like Islamically, he's got nothing. Like I was thinking, like he started his own entrepreneurial business, he but did. it's not like he was that successful. He's like a copywriter or something. Like I re- listened to the Mad Mum Looks episode, and it was just like very blah, like blah, blah. It was it wasn't that much to it. He's like, yeah, I'm from Sri Lanka. I went to the US. My dad sponsored my studies, but I did nothing for six years. I always like random stuff. I'm like, bro, you're not a stellar human being. <laughs> like, not saying he's a bad guy. He's probably like a good guy in I'm some ways, but his ideas are cooked, like very cooked. Anyways, um, probably but we, 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 right we, we came to find out. We came to find out rather. Yeah, Instead later. Of, I actually yeah. didn't know the extent. Like, but yeah. So sorry, Josh. Um, so I asked Josh. Uh, sorry, um, Raf. Like, what's been his most um enjoyed episode what did i even say like if transformative? you said memorable then it was probably memorable the nebula z's episode <laughs> <laughs> what's been your most i guess i don't know memorable transformative episode you've done or anything that sticks out from all the episodes um, so shagazade and zira they're like oh, like yeah. really brilliant orators like they're really easy to talk to and they broke down like eastern poetry so plainly like coleman barks and the western translations and how it's come about i need to listen to that again and then, of course, uh, Mamadou Tal was good as well. That was more like kickback. And like, I remember it was just good content overall. I think he's cancelled me. No, oh, that's Dev's but yeah, At least, we, I don't know at what least we have the episode. No, nah, I think I have why, a hunch. Why did he? Oh, because of like your. I like, think what happened on. Tw- yeah, it's so close to Sufistic leaning. Oh, that could be that. Or like Sufistic leanings are portrayed such that I'm just I'm almost like Hamza Yusuf like yeah. politics where it's like I'll just accept the society you just got to work on yourself um, and I think we find a good balance between that to be honest when it comes to you know I guess um, you know 40 and being better people and emotions and all that and also politics and what we need to do so I guess when I do post about more Sufistic stuff um, it comes across in a certain way about my politics but I don't have an issue like I like his stuff um, a lot of people I know I actually like it's confusing because I know a lot of traditionists dislike him because you know but he's like, like the, he, he doesn't I don't know like the details him, people people make this I've heard it he doesn't oh you know we might have friends, stuck, uh, yeah. stood up for I've, him I, 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 I have friends that study Al-Azhar and know him and you know his, these ideas like, yeah it's like a personal I've, thing I've listened to a lot of his content I've even listened to his podcast too, bro I, his I, had, I don't I don't see it I honestly don't see it. I don't know what is like so concerning and stuff like that. If he said specific, I don't know, Kufri or deviant 
specific statements then okay tell me but i haven't come up, i've listened i've listened to the baraka boys podcast i've listened to all his um oh not all but a lot of his like um the malcolm effect, Ma- malcolm effect. it's a good it's a good podcast because it actually addresses like you know proper you know f- for example he gets lawyers on and then addressing the system or racism within the system like all these sort of important discussions he's a gun speaker actually, though that's the thing too like he's just really good to listen he, to him. i like listening he to him. doesn't mind being abrasive like he just like Lashes back at the traditionalists, but him and Mahin have proper like like he made dua against Mahin. It was like it got really bad. Yeah. And so I think there was the whole. Probably, yeah. um, I don't know if you saw like long time ago. He 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 said he did a tweet like I'm doing Ziara Karl Marx's grave. But he did that as a joke, right? Yeah, that was clearly a joke. And I liked it. And people everyone, message. I had people message me see, seeing me. I liked it. Saying why did you like this? You know, stuff yeah, for like I'm like, so, dude, it's a joke. Like he, he knew the traditionalists would I know, about it. You know what's so funny? It's always those traditionalists, the same people who would have messaged you who have been like, oh, look at the leftists getting so triggered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then, then they, they got so triggered, triggered. They yeah. by that joke, you know? It's funny. Like, it, it's the best troll ever. Yeah. Like, it's so good. But, um, and then what, what other episodes? There was him and then, um, all of Taba episodes, like very insightful, obviously, because Taba is like a, he's like, I preferred nah jokes. He's like one of the main guys in terms of critical race theory, Australian context. Um, oh. You're gonna get oh. cancelled, Josh. <laughs> no, he's gone. No, sorry, not critical race theory. Um, uh, life experiences. <laughs> was, I don't know what to say. Now, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's no, no. just a life experiences the, guy. Um, I saw him just then, so it'd be a bit, a bit, a bit awkward. Um, but <laughs> this is not gonna be in the podcast. Beyond that, who, who else did we have? Like. I feel like I'm missing so many. Um, Salah Basi one I really liked. Oy, that was good. And you came on halfway. You woke up late and came on halfway through. Sarkum guys, sorry, just tuning in. It was like yeah, something like that. That was mad. <laughs> you chimed in like, and you got straight into it. Though, but I, I feel like we touched on really like, I think Can't I remember it was up. like about um, capitalism and shaping, I guess, um, the rulings, um, like thick ruling. Like, we went into that. Do you remember that? Sort of, sort of. Uh, he's, he's very off the radar nowadays. He's not on Insta as much, I think. Yeah. I don't know. But What about Abdullah Kunde? That was a good episode. Chats with him, I liked yeah. that. I liked that episode a lot. Um, and then what other episodes? I'm trying to think. Sadi's episode was pretty good. The it was more like a like one. a friends. Like he talks about poetry, and he oh, knows yeah. a lot. So he's like a bit of a poetry specialist in a way. Yeah. And then he's um, a local poetry guru. Yeah, lo- local poetry specialist. And then who? I'm trying to think of who else we had. I got to If I scroll the list, I'd be like, oh yeah, that one. Was I'll really tell good. you, I, one of the um, ad as well. You know. Um, the episode of Muhammad Ishaq, that's like by far, uh, by far. So, Muhammad Ishaq, and then the second one with Ahmed Karat. Oh, well, Ahmed Karat as well. Just the episodes with yeah. Ahmed Karat in general. He's just a good guy to talk to, man. Yeah, he's amazing, mashallah. And, you know, our episode, the first episode of Muhammad Ishaq, that's by far, by far the most general, by like a considerable yeah, amount. It's, it's like insane. 10, like it went proper. More than the next one. Mm, mm. Yeah, it is. It is. It's like 13K. Or even more. Which one was this? Muhammad Ishaq. Like it's, oh, yeah. it's number one uh, downloaded episode by far. Like mm, by yeah, far. Yeah. By I remember seeing it a while back. Like it had, went like, around. It did, radios like have played it, our episode on. Damn. Uh, like it's done. I'm it was like, cracking, bro. That was amazing. He's yeah, another bro. guy though. Like just the... In terms of pure speaking ability and compelling, like the way he's able to be passionate but also flow and be lucid in his conversations mm-hmm. is like an art. I, I think it's incredible. I, we owe um, uh, Sheikh Oman Baloch, like, I think our episode with him, he went, did the rounds on YouTube. <laughs> mm, <laughs> Let's yeah, see how many views he got. The um, Tarek Tamar was pretty cool. Yes. I really but like you that. guys will come back, like, conflict, not like yeah. in a bad way, but it was like a lot of like back and forth. Um, but it's because he was talking about Rami or something. But he was very well spoken. He's um, a smart guy, bro. Yeah, mashallah. He's he's big I'm on Twitter. With him, yeah. And then um, what about Shabir? Not Shabir. Shubu Subur Ahmed. Subur Ahmed. Yeah, that was good. That was good. Subur it was Ahmed, evolution and stuff. Abdul um Abdul Rahim Green's episode was really good. Oh yeah, that was amazing, bro. Yeah. That slept on man. That I, guy. I haven't listened to that one. That guy, like um, that guy. <laughs> he he really um, he seems like a really good guy. I think he's just like accumulate so much experience and knowledge in yeah. the sense of like dawah and people and that he just imparts that like it's like it's, that, it's like that sage he's that a genuine done. wise man like, yeah his proper like switched on mashallah he I really like that episode yeah. you know that part about I love how um, he talked about like you know how we have this like it's a snippet that we have on our Instagram it's like um, you know 
the Western people, like, you know, uh, in, in our Dawah, it's told us, you know, have good manners, good akhlaq, and this and that, right? And it's really, really hyper-emphasized at times. Like, I'm, we, we talked about this in this episode just then, and I mentioned, like, a caveat, but there's times where you need to, you know, put your foot down. But then usually in Dawah, it's, like, only, like, perfect good manners, and that's it. And so what he said is, like, from the Western's perspective, it, they don't think that you are you have this amazing akhlaq because of your Islam. It's because they think that you came to the West and became civilized is why you have this good akhlaq. I'm like, wow. Like, he articulated almost like thoughts of like, you know, critical race here. It's in like, critical race have, though, yeah. he said, because he said it without that language mm. of the CRT, mm. but he articulated really interesting in that way. I'm just like, wow. Like, and it just made me think like, this is why like these fields are like so amazing because like they, articulate those experiences properly whereas someone like he's articulating mashallah but he's doing it from just kind of just genuine, genuine like, like experience and stuff that's but, what I mean, yeah. but you know how there's this kind of um pick um, people paint crt mm. being like you know you're just a relative moral relativist right mm, mm. because you know you truth is subjective right but it's a really really wrong way of seeing things because it's like when you talk about experiences we know as Muslims going about society, we have different experiences to it, you know, and white, non-Muslim, right? In many, many ways, right? Obviously, the basic ones, Islamophobia, all that sort of stuff, right? So, you have these different experiences, right? It's, I'm not saying there's, you know, I don't know, truth is relative or whatever. It's just different experiences with different people going about society. Like, that's your truth, right? That is a truth. The experiences that we have as Muslims is a truth. And so, this field, CRT, unpacks those that truth right in a language that you have like i don't know for example like you have was it code switching you have mm. like all these aspects about life within you know the west and experiences of you know minorities and all this like so many things to unpack right uh, uh, yeah, so much course. to discuss like all of those little minor th- sort of subtle things that again if i had not been exposed to even in a cursory way my experience of Islam and my experience of the world would be completely different and I would yeah. probably uh, be guilty of a lot of excesses um, and a lot of like dhulm almost against people by exacting my own like cultural standards which are Western for the most part very Western onto Muslims and Muslims around and then thinking that I'm on a parody with them just because I've accepted uh, like the truth but it's not the case mm. Yeah, like it isn't the case, bro. Like you can still be oppressive towards Muslims, even though you're both on the truth. Yeah. But it's in a subtle way. Exactly. Um, all right. Wait, I have a question, but it can't be recorded. It has to be. I'm not gonna cut it out randomly. But we're finished anyway. No. I feel like we're finished. I feel like we've exhausted. What's it? Why is it that controversial? Is it something controversial? It's controversial and it's such a cliche podcast conversation that I don't want to have, but it's like something that's really Just on my mind. It but it can't be on the podcast. Okay, to then tell it later. No, I have to ask it now. I'm not going to edit that. We, we, can, we can wrap it up. Yeah? You were... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's 11 30. I need to go. We've got a game in like four hours, bro. Yeah, that's true. Um, Wait, one, sorry. I have one question, one quick question, I think. Um, I've been waiting to, because have you all at the same time. And I was meant to do like 100 episodes, because we, I'm not like 100 episodes, like that's pretty good, right? And so we'll pass 100 episodes. And um, at the same time, it's like when we got past 100 episodes, I'm like, what's the direction of the podcast? Will we just continue conversation? That's kind of what it is. But we want to talk about different things. Um, but what would you say, um, have you ever imagined we would get this amount of traction worldwide when we started out? We're not that huge, but... How much traction do we have? Decent amount. I think decent amount to be content with. Honestly, when I'm here and when I'm doing the episodes... I don't think about the thing like it's weird because I don't actually think about anyone listening to it. That's why I literally sit here. I'm talking I'm like it trips me out that someone listens to this. But at the same, I'm not saying our conversation is is absolute shit. But like, I'm like, bro, come on, like us, we're just some guys. But at the same time, yeah, it's it's just like a a weird. It's maybe like an inferiority complex. I don't know because I know there are people. I know there are people who speak 
more authoritatively on their podcasts who talk a lot of shit. That's the only way in which I can measure myself and like be like, oh no, it's okay that I do this. Does that make sense? But at the same time, I divorce myself from the fact that there's an audience, which is not always a good thing, but I do. Like, psych, like I, it's a weird kind of object permanence issue I have and I've always had where what I don't see doesn't really, like, it's not there. I'm not conscious of it. So, like, I don't see anyone listening. So, I don't think there's anyone listening. Um, and so, it's, it's hard for me to imagine when I do, like, actually see people listening and commenting on our podcast. I'm like, wow. It, it's kind of humbling in a way, but also kind of daunting in a way. Um, but no, I wouldn't have thought that. I wouldn't have. What about you, Josh? Um, I reckon with that reach, like, if anything, it's a testament to how much hard work you've put in Tenzin because you sort of drove this from the ground up. And yeah, I don't think any of us can lay claim to like um, like putting in the same amount of effort as you did. Yes, yeah, especially true. given my life circumstances, I was like, I don't know if I don't know if. But I did nothing. He and try. He was just like, hey, we're doing an episode this time. Contribute where I can. And he picked me up, and then I came here. Yeah, and I was yeah. Like, oh, so who we talk? So but yeah, I'd be like I said, like, who we talk? I think to um, today? yeah, because a lot of us don't understand like a lot of the early um like social media push and like analytics and like i don't know like uh, marketing that you did i think that got it off the ground and then there was like a bit of a twitter following and then we have our whatsapp chats as well so there's some dissemination and instagram as well i think there's quite a bit of tra tra traction on instagram because that's the only social media that young people like under 30 use anyway so like there's a lot of resharing there so yeah i think it's pretty good like it, it's it's like yeah testament to your effort it, and work because yeah. otherwise yeah like as in like to be constantly like sharing resharing and like creating snippets this and that is actually a lot of work so that's i think snippets drive it to a large degree and then the viral phenomenon happens when obviously when there's controversy in the episode <laughs> but that only <laughs> that only helps the platform i think that only helps the podcast itself to get bigger so yeah I think, yeah, alhamdulillah, it's, as in, like, I reckon BITC is a mainstay in terms of, like, hosting people and having certain discussions, which you won't get elsewhere, because and you're beautiful a, lot of, a lot of other podcasts are more superficial, or they don't give airtime to the right people, because I follow is Muslim ones, no, as in TMM, Safina Society, Diffuse Congruence, but they're a bit dead, but I don't listen to, like, um... F coffee grounds or whatever, a freshly ground, freshly a, bar a baraka boys. I don't listen to those ones, so like I don't even know what's in those ones. But some of them I do follow, and then Mahin's one is ma uh, amazing as well. But that's very American slant and more local and not as intellectual. Um, even though he does have like really amazing guests as well. So yeah, I think there's definitely a niche for BATC to continue in the future. Yeah, no, definitely. I uh, I think um, yeah, there's a lot. Thank, appreciate kind words. Um, I, I, uh, you know, nowadays it's a bit hard to be honest to do like working full time, family commitments, cricket and stuff. It's not easy, but so I understand. And at the same time, I think what mm. drives me still is I like what you said that niche. I I still do feel that we're not like big, big, right? We're not like a one path network or something, but I know the topics that we're hitting yeah. is because that's why I started in the, like we, not I, like shout out to Akib, Irfan, they're all in the initial stages, right? They're not with us as, um, in our core yeah, kind of group now. With us. <laughs> mm. They're with us in us in our hearts. SubhanAllah. And uh, I think why we started was because we wanted to speak to someone from, from the hizb and the sufi mm, and mm. these academics and unpack their ideas because i for me and that when you're navigating all these different ideas it's like who's i want to hear like everyone in the same like kind of platform i want to see i have to kind of go to their spaces to figure out what they're saying or go to another mm. space so like for me it's like you know a problem and also i wanted to see things a bit um, I, I think there's also no true unprejudiced platform like a lot of the american ones are very much right-leaning and yeah. they don't they don't get a lot of the intellectual movement, whereas you can hold a conversation in them, whereas they they can't and they can't delve into those. So there's that aspect as well. Like even with like I guess um, leftist thought or yeah, exactly. anything to do you know, ideas within academia, 
I think I have I honestly like there is um another good one is like thinking Muslim podcast, uh, mashallah. Um but you won't I think we still have a different style because we're a bit more com- that's very interview style. Whereas us we're more conversational. Sometimes we banter, sometimes we don't. It's kind of like different depends on the vibe. Oh uh, yeah, I think yeah. Muslim. They're they're good as well. They had Sheikh Abdul and Murad on they one not too long ago. Actually that was a good one. Like I listened to that. Yeah. That was the first one of theirs I listened to and no, that's like but well, it's very content heavy. Um, so it depends, like. Um, but yeah, anyway. So like, for from my perspective, I know that we're hitting a niche, and I do feel that. Like, I think, for example, when we're talking about um, CRT, when we're talking about four temperaments, we're doing it from a perspective that I just haven't heard at all from different platforms. Like, you're not gonna get that kind of juice, to be honest. Yeah, I'm yep. not saying that's the only reason I do it, but like, I'm just trying to. Mm. For me, it's like, you know, I'm not like a perfect Muslim by any stretch of the matter. You know, I've got a lot of flaws. I just go about society. Um, you know, I'm Muslim. I am proud, alhamdulillah, but I'm not like, you know, I'm flawed. And at the end of the day, like, I still want to feel like I'm doing something and contributing something. So, inshallah, like, you know, hopefully with the right intentions, you know, it can be, you know, on, on my scales on the day of judgment. And if, 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 if there is like, you know, there's there's no goodness in this or there's no sense of like you know there's not going to benefit me i honestly don't want to do it i'm not saying i have a pure intentions but i mm. that's what i do think and i do think about that a lot um and you know i'd rather put my energy elsewhere where there's a lot, lot more goodness mm. but mm. i guess i have you know i think it what drives it is seeing people message me or come up to me and being like you know mm. really like this i really like that and you know i think it does mm. i was talking so, so to um one of our friends, I do feel that we come from a unique standpoint because you'll see a lot of leftists that are not Muslim when they're coming into Islam and they're interested in Islam. We have a very good entry point into into the very Sufi approach, very kind of, you know, we understand the... the, the Don't say Sufi ma- approach. Mm. Sorry, <laughs> the Sawuf approach. The Sawuf approach, okay, cool. Just and this orthodox. Like, yeah, and, and, and the political <laughs> <laughs> orthodox Islam, like spiritual lens, right? Orthodox. Okay, so okay. Just Muslim, Muslim. Yeah. <laughs> just, uh, <laughs> just correct. Yeah. Just a correct approach. Just correct. the correct approach. And we have that entry point and then we obviously talk about politics. So like we have that mm, entry mm. point. It allows them to see me. I've had a lot of messages like that. I've had people message me and being interested in Islam, mm. ask me for books, ask yeah, me for this. Yeah, because it's like the way we approach Islam it's not like common, common. Mm. Like you won't get like even with what's the po- m- uh, most... Fo- one of the most famous like content Muslim content creators like Maul Hijab he has a bit of a Salafish bent not that he's like you know not spiritual and he's spiritual mashallah he's not like a Salafi Salafi but like we still have a v- bit of a different approach to him obviously right mm-hmm. as evidence in how he approached like JP conversation and stuff like that so like I do find that we still have this unique uh, you know entry point and honestly like mm-hmm. I even though I, mo- I host like every episode like you know, if someone is there better than me and wants to like do this, like I honestly don't mind like giving it to them. Mm. Like it's always been about the kind of um, our uh, our sort of goals as a niche, uh, as as boys in the case, just to get interesting thoughts, ideas out yeah. there to do with Islam yeah. that isn't being covered mm. and having it mm. having those kind of discussions and deep discussions with other. Mm. And obviously, I'm not saying we're <coughs> deep, deep. Like obviously, um, mashallah, there's so many other you know, more intelligent people than me that can mm. have these discussions more. But for me, I think where we're unique and I've always maintained this, mm. it gives me a bit of confidence is that I'm not the brightest, you know, I'm not the sharpest tool in the box, but I think when a not so smart person has a discussion with someone that's a lot more much learned, they have to kind of dumb it down a little. Does that make sense? And so because of that, it allows a better access point for people to actually, in, you know, engage with the discussion. Does that make sense? Rather than mm, kind of being like, mm, to be yeah. to be honest, though, some people have said like, oh, sometimes it's, uh, it's a lot content heavy and it flies over my head or whatever, which is true. Um, uh, it can and in some episodes, but I still do maintain mm. like that's like the role I can play in the sense that making it a bit more accessible, mm. digestible for the lay, right? So anyway, so like, inshallah, make dua for us as well. Um, you know, this podcast is a benefit and baraka and, you know, mm. gets on the good yeah. deeds. And if you benefit from it as well, like just shoot a message, mm. honestly. I, I don't know if it's enough thing, probably is, but. Just some um, <laughs> final thoughts. So, yeah, I reckon definitely you have that unique perspective that you do bring where you can learn from someone more knowledgeable and 
break it down for a more lay audience who have some familiarity at least with like I don't know humanities politics Islam etc and then I think like you're not we're not you're not trying to be like these like like a one path or a Mohammed hijab who have like proper like media machines behind them like they have like studios like full-time staff etc and they have like people like actually like whose actual career is to boost their um, views and stuff like that so we're not going to get at that level but i don't think that's what you're trying to do either you're yeah, trying to ser- I'm not, you're trying I'm to serve that niche and clearly from the messages that you get you do have a profound impact on people's lives so i think definitely for the sake of allah you're, that's still there for the sake of allah it's not about the outcome or the result result yeah. right it's always about the intention which you have but alhamdulillah you I see the so. you see the results there as well it's like very left field i see some of the comments in the inbox i'm like who are all these people messaging throughout the years um but yeah i think another thing is that uh, obviously people get busy their lives continue on like it goes in different directions especially like with kids and stuff it's a lot harder uh, it might get a lot harder for you down the road but i think like you're in a position in the community where people know you across the UK, across the US as well, like your actual proper contact in Australia. Alhamdulillah, like people know you and they can vouch for you and refer to you. So even if say like down the road, like you had to lessen the frequency, which is I think a model that diffuse congruence they do, like they have feature episodes every two, three months, but they're really quality episodes. That's because the dudes are like 40, 45, right? And they've got like kids who are like, getting married and stuff but i think even an approach like that is like you're known as that like that person in australia who can host these conversations and people still refer to you because of your um because of your presence on yeah. twitter and instagram etc so you have those solid links established which i think not many in australia have gone to the effort of creating because really yeah. one path uh, i'll say the very insular it's just like their own thing and if it doesn't fit their vibe then they don't engage or they don't pursue. Same with anyone else in Australia. It's very much only what fits their vibe they pursue, whereas you're active in engaging a lot of different people from different um, backgrounds, whether it's like the more hot, uh, more um, Najdi Dawa versus the more Muslim. <laughs> Thank more you, Islamic. <laughs> <laughs> as in, you're not as discriminant with it. Like you try to include all perspectives that are beneficial. So I think that... Um, it's hard to get to that position where like oh yeah here's that guy in australia i can like even knowing someone like mahin like and he's like everyone knows him right so he can vouch for you and like if you have guests on or stuff like that do you get what i mean as in like having those contacts i think is very beneficial and not many people in our community have that standing so even if BITC redirects towards other things or you do other sort of work for other organizations you'll still have those contacts which you can take along and make yourself yeah yeah. uh, very Privileged to many intelligent Muslim academics, scholars. Yeah, as in, you had them. Like, these are all the Like, there's like random dudes from Scotland and stuff. Like, you know, um, I'll say like first of all, I just want to say thank you to you for like having me on the podcast. Like I said, uh, people probably don't see it, but like Tanzim does everything, and then like he'll call me and be like, "Hey, we're gonna do an episode today." And I just get to go and like a lot of the time I go and I talk to some academic or I talk to some short scholar or some great thinker and get to pick their brain. Um, and all of that owes itself to Tanzim. And then obviously for other people as well. But let's see, like just uh, you are, you've done an immense amount of work and you've put a lot of hours into this. And you'll probably say, oh no, but I love it. But it, you know it's not always easy. Like you know deep down it's not always easy. And that's the thing. People think that the more cynical perhaps would say oh you know this is a young clout chasing dude but i know that's not the case because i know how much you've had to sacrifice and how hard you've had to work and how many how many difficult situations um have arisen like financially practically uh from having the podcast but you've you've sold it on you persevered you pushed through that and you've continued because i think you genuinely believe it's the right thing to do and i suppose um to that everyone who listens and myself who's been able to come and host um rather sporadically maybe but but enough uh, episodes with you so I, i've really enjoyed that and i think one final thing i'd say an observation i'd make about the podcast in general i wouldn't view each episode as separate even though there's no story or coherent uh tangential flow like where you can see you know a, a narrative that has a beginning a conclusion and an end but what i can definitely see and it's beautiful and like i'm i don't want to cry i will cry maybe um 
if the feels hit me and it's like the journey that you've been on and the podcast has been on such as like when we started when the podcast started i mean i didn't i heard about it through mm. nabila was actually listening to it um and i heard about it and i would listen to the episodes and early on I, do you remember you you gathered around the yeti mm. interviewing mohammed gilan and daniel hakikachu wide eyed and and and, and, and boys, rest in peace that's boys. It. wide eyed and very different and then you see around episode 17 and a bit earlier <laughs> certain changes and certain ideas start to take hold and then you go further along and some of the conversations that we have start to change again and if you if you look if you listen to all the episodes in chronological order what you actually get is a diary an intellectual That's diary true, yeah. of a young muslim man living in the west uh coming to terms with a lot of the ideas and and coming to terms with a lot of the realities Uh, that he faces and that he confronts on the daily and trying to interpret that and share that with other people and people might this is the thing people would probably and academics and i, I realize how sometimes limited they are in their view of these things because they'll they'll certainly lambast you for your uh, naivety on things and 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 lament the fact that men have podcasts and and uh, i know where they're coming from but the reality is if if you're less jaded and sort of more wide-eyed if you take it for what it is as a, a series of conversations and ideas and and the development and as i said a diary almost of a young man um three young muslim men in australia four young muslim men in australia with others as well then it's like a, a flower like the growth the growth of a garden in spring or something like that like it's it's something that you see the process and you see the flourishing and you see the change and it's it's like beautiful it really is beautiful and even if you hate certain things about it or you may have not like particular it's like a, a tv series you don't love every scene in it but as a, as the, at the end it's a piece of art oh, and it it builds the person and who they are and whatever you've done and this is why i'm very this is the the crux of my critique to a lot of the critics it's not that they don't have points it's that they don't just see thing they don't just see it for what it is and appreciate it for what it is and you have to you have to do that i do that i mean i see this podcast as like the phenomenal recording of of my own and you can feel you can see my reactions and you can feel my reactions in the brief time but even more so with yourself like in real time as things go into our brain and change the way we see the world and we see our faith and we see our our lord you know and i don't i don't know why anyone could have a problem with that it's just that it's it's a documentary it's a documentary and it is what it is whether it's right or wrong true or false it is what it is and it's something it's life and it's incredible it's a fitting way to finish it off like bangstown uh slang it's like it is what it is it is what it is <laughs> no nah, but bro that was beautiful and the analogy as well um just call the episode it is what it is <laughs> <laughs> no nah, it's so true I actually wrote that in my notes in terms of discuss like i don't know ideas that change along the way but you just summed it up really nicely like definitely like i think um BRTC has changed me Yeah. Um nice. that's so I can't feel like oh like you know I'm giving to the people. I can't do that because I know that I've been more in a privileged position especially like having yeah, the freedom I, to to the ask defense. questions that I wanted answered even though it's masked as a question. <laughs> no. It's actually questions that I was curious about that, that I wanted to ask like this, you know, intelligent, you know, individual, right? And they answered in that man and I've had many like moments like that like this is burning question I always wanted to ask this this guest and you know I act like it's not from me it's just kind of a question I'm asking them and so you know BITC has definitely changed me like and I don't know what I'll do without it um at all to be honest because it's like all my like so many of my ideas I was proper like um you know I I was proper anti feminist and anti like you know I was yeah. totally like I my politics charts your intellectual even like sp things. spirituality wise like how i perceive things i was very like a bit more leaning 100, materialist yeah. 
Um, so, so many things that I just kind of, you know, through time and, you know, because it's not even just like oh, as if all my questions were answered on the podcast by these guests. It was more like they sparked something or they said something and you just kind of look into it. And it's like, okay, well, okay. Yeah. And then you start going. And then well, especially yeah. with you guys, like spending, you know, a lot of time talking with you and unpacking a lot of our realities has definitely um, helped in the process as well. So, you know, I appreciate your contributions mm-hmm. and uh, much like, especially like with Josh, with his expertise, his knowledge, his experiences as well, like, you know, being um, the oldest out of us and with Raphael as well, mashallah, like... Being the youngest having out the of us. <laughs> 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 no, but mashallah, like, you guys have such, like, you know, um, unique contributions and angles to address things. Like, I think Raphael being on the... Like, me and Josh started it, but, like, Raphael has been a huge, huge boost for us as well in the sense of what he brings to the table, um, the way we access discussions, the way you talk about, you know, from the Islamic perspective, you know, that because you're a lot more Islamically trained than, than I am. Oh, I don't know about that. I'm nah, I'm definitely, bro. Like, <laughs> I called him, I called him yesterday. I'm like, I was calling Raf, uh, Raf. Uh, <laughs> I was like, hey, bro, you're right. Like, what's up? And he's just like, well, what's wrong? I'm like, oh, no, I was just like, because I was going to ask you to record for today. And you're just like, oh, I've got a meeting. I think he said he got a meeting. I had a fit class. Yeah. And then you're just like, yeah, I had a fit class. And then in my head, I'm like, mashallah, mashallah, he's uh, representing the BITC community mo- really really well mashallah I just, um, uh, bro, so, yeah, I'm full uh, of shit though. <laughs> modesty is like it's just a meaning it's just, I'm not <laughs> studying fifth or yeah. he's trying to I'm not cover two lessons like, away from like, being yeah, bro, it's, just, it's just dunya yeah. it's, just, it's, not, it's not sacred knowledge it's just dunya bro, I don't even know Arabic like that, that's my biggest regret that I haven't in this time learned Arabic that, that's mm-hmm. like got to be the purpose of my life mm-hmm. no but you're young bro and me as well I haven't learned Arabic um, and still in the journey inshallah so mm-hmm. it's you know we've got time but that we can learn Arabic, guys, i mean um but yeah i think it's really it, BITC has given me a lot um helped me be, you know c- come to where i am today and i'm very very blessed and um thankful as well and inshallah yeah we'll continue this legacy and for me it's also sometimes thinking that it's not even about the to me I've never been about the numbers. I feel I find that overwhelming anyway. Like but it's it's more so for me, I want to also like because content's online, it's out there, it's available. You have some you know, sometimes I think about this scenario in my head, like, you know, five years or ten years down the line or twenty years or hundred years, hundred and fifty years later, some random like um guy from the Bankstown the <laughs> tunes in <Yeah>. gay Islam <laughs> Tava. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and it comes our episode comes up do you remember the um help my friend is gay part one and two yeah <laughs> so like well those episodes come up i don't know yeah. <laughs> but anyway so like it comes up and they view and they're like whoa like you whoa. know in, and in my you might change the perspectives or you know so that's kind of how i view things and uh inshallah like we continue i'm not saying i've pure in, i hope i have you know the right intentions but please make dua for us and also, I'll probably wrap it up this way. You guys are zoned out both on your phones. I'm just writing a, what I, like uh, a summary, basically, of some of those things that we said today. That's, uh, I've got my notes open. You can see. Tandem. I'm not just I'm tuning sure. out. I'm looking up burger places open now. <laughs> <laughs> it's not midnight. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, keep supporting us. We'll keep getting our guests, inshallah. We'll keep doing internals. We have mixed reviews about internals. Um, a lot of people like it. Some people like, oh, it Some disturbs like, the floor. The f- like, Depends on their temperament. The beep, beep, beep. Yeah. Some people like, it's not structured. I hate this free nah, conversation. Some people just think like, why would I listen to you? And it's like, yeah, okay. No worries. Yeah, but I think that's fair enough too. Like, as in, like, but then other have people to. have messaged me being like, no, you guys are like, I, I like the internal like more that, yeah. because it's so much more like laid back and True, casual. Yeah. And they, you know, they have these thoughts themselves. And it's like, even in a way, like, it's it's refreshing or relaxing for some people just to hear their view podcast. just to hear that there are Muslims who are neurotic like them. <laughs> like you, you see my neurosis, mm. and then it's like, oh damn, like he's like that. So I'm not alone in this. Yeah, for sure. Let's probably wrap it up there. Um, yeah. Bro, support I'm us. Hungry. Support us on Patreon. We need money. <laughs> so um, go on yeah. patreoncom slash boys in the cave. One hundred and uh donate to us inshallah and we'll keep doing our project keep doing our thing and um, please message us if you have any thoughts or you know any queries you want to share with us until then you know peace out assalamualaikum um
And yeah, take it easy. Sayyidina Khatib al Umam, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Sayyidina Alam al Huda, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Sayyidina Kashif al Kurab, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Sayyidina Rafi al Rutab, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Sayyidina Izz al Arab, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Sayyidina Sahib al Faraj, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Sayyidina Rafi al Daraj, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. سيدنا كريم المخرج صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه وبارك وسلم اللهم يا رب بجاه نبيك المصطفى ورسولك المرتضى طهر قلوبنا من كل وسف يباعدنا عن مشاهدتك ومحبتك وأمتنا على السنة والجماعة والشوق إلى لقائك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام وصلى الله على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه وبارك وسلم سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين فاتحة